Uh, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the, another meeting of the Arlington Board of Selectmen. We are not dealing with traffic light issues tonight. Um, we are still in our, uh, this is really the school committee. Uh, uh, despite rumors of a coup in town, we are not running the place. Don't blame us for the traffic light. Um, the, uh, we, we're here for the duration while we have a defective elevator at the high school. Uh, our meetings must be ADA compliant, so that's why we've been hanging out here since uh, the beginning of the school year. We've enjoyed uh, these surroundings. Superintendent Bodie, do we have a report on the elevator? <laughs> <laughs> How are We're they doing? Two weeks, if not longer, out. Uh, okay, uh, I understand so we'll we had. We'll be here next week. Yeah, we'll be here next week. I understand we had to uh, contact the curator of the elevator museum in order to get the requisite parts to to, uh, to fix this thing. They're on site, from what I understand, but it did take a long time. And how noisy is it? So far, not bad. Okay. I, I actually haven't heard it. And you're right next to it. You're right at uh, the center of the action. In any case, the first item on our agenda in these beautiful quarters uh, is public participation. The rules are basically that uh, people under public participation have three minutes to uh, speak to us. We customarily do not respond in open session. Uh, we may schedule things for an agenda item at a later time or refer them to subcommittee if, uh, if we deem to need so, but we do not act on things that are not on our agenda tonight. So the first person is Jeff Haddon from Dallin. Good evening. My name is Jeff Haddon. I live at 190 Sylvia Street, and I'm the proud parent of a current Dallin first grader as well as two future Dallin students. To borrow a line from Dr. McKibben's September 24th enrollment presentation, my family and I are part of the enrollment problem. <laughs> uh, I'm here tonight to speak on behalf of Dallin first grade parents who remain concerned about our children's class size. This represents the third time this year that we've addressed the entire school committee, having first sent a letter of concern signed by 50 parents through school committee ch chair Schlickman and Dr. Bodie on September 9th, followed by Barb Brandon addressing the committee on September 10th. Before I state our concerns, I'd like to be clear that we understand and appreciate the many constraints in terms of school facilities, budget, and increasing enrollment. As a group, we've asked for and received the October enrollment reports from 2009 to 2015. We've attended the September 24th enrollment and space planning meeting. We have read uh, both reports in great detail. We reviewed the school budget for fiscal years 2012, sorry, 2010 through 2016, and over the last month, we've met individually with two members of this committee, our school's principal, and we have a meeting scheduled for next week with Dr. Bodie. Our concern is that even with all the district-wide challenges that Arlington faces, our children's first grade class is an outlier when compared to other K through two cohorts, with no guarantee that it will improve next year or in their later elementary years. When our kids entered kindergarten last year, their October 2014 average class size of 24.7 was the highest of any kindergarten, first or second grade district-wide. By the end of the year, enrollment grew to an average class size of 25.7, which was two more than the next highest kindergarten and 4.5 more than the average kindergarten. With our kids now in first grade, Dallin class size continues to grow, reaching 81 students per the October 2015 enrollment report. The solution to this challenge was to add a combined kindergarten, first year, first grade classroom. While, while we agree that this one year stopgap has brought average class size down for the current year, if nothing is done for next year, the average Dallin second grade class will jump to 27, representing the highest average class size of any K through second grade since the buffer zone was implemented. Looking at Dallin, uh, first grade versus the entire K through fifth system, there are 10 grade cohorts of 80 kids or more, including Hardy and Thompson first grades who also have 81. All of these cohorts have four full-time classrooms, except Dallin, which has three and a half. If nothing is done for next year, the Dallin second grade will be the only grade in the system with 80 or more kids, but not four classrooms. We realize that class size is an important issue for the school committee as they look at district enrollment and plan for the future. Preventing these extra large class sizes should be an ongoing pri high priority given their impact on children's learning and development. 
Adding a fourth classroom for our children is an immediate step in the right direction. This is the change that we as parents are requesting. But more importantly, this is the change that our children deserve as students in the Arlington public school system. Returning to three classrooms with an average of 27 children per class, be it next year or in their later elementary years, is not acceptable or equal. The addition of a fourth classroom will create an appropriate learning environment for next year and beyond. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Haddon. Next is Julie Rascio. Thank you so much for letting me have a chance to speak tonight. Um, I actually wanted to touch upon two different things. Um, so I work at the American Cancer Society, specifically as the community, community manager for Arlington. I've worked with the Arlington schools, um, specifically the high school for this will be the fourth year. Um, and I've seen some tremendous growth and tremendous involvement from the school as well. Um, the first thing that I wanted to touch on is something that's actually happening and taking place next Thursday, which is the American Cancer Society Great American Smoke Out. I know the school has a very involved Club 84, um, and I have shared this information with their leader as well, um, but just wanted to share it on a wider scale as well. Um, we know that about 42 million Americans still smoke, and tobacco use remains the largest preventable cause of disease and premature death in the U.S., as that number has decreased over the past 20 years, we know that there are still 3,000 children under the age of 18 who start smoking every day, whether that is cigarettes or any of the e-tobacco um, that is being promoted for younger students at this point. So the Great American Smoke Out is really a chance for people who are currently smoking to quit for one day and really start getting those benefits of not smoking. It doesn't take a lifetime to get benefits. It can happen in as little as 20 minutes. So that is just the first thing that we wanted um, to share about tonight. Um, I have given Ms. Fitzgerald um, some information as well. We actually have designed programs um, for schools to be able to implement about tobacco prevention starting from grade kindergarten all the way through eighth grade. Um, so just wanted to be able to share those with the school in general um, to hope that we can decrease that number even more and stop children from preventing smoking because that is such a huge and easy preventable thing that we can do. Um, the second thing um, is Relay for Life um, that happens every June at the high school. Um, it has this year will actually be our 16th year in year 14, the town of Arlington um, reached $1 million that they had raised in 14 years. And last year, in year 15, we reached the $1.25 million mark. Um, so very proud things for Arlington to be proud of as a whole, um, and especially our youth, because our event is about 85 to 90% students. So it's a huge thing for the youth to be able to be involved in and really show their um, philanthropic efforts and really bring the community together for a common cause that has hit so many of us, um, especially with this past, the events of this past year. So um, that was what I wanted to share. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ted Bowen. My mistake, I thought this was a sign-in sheet for attendees. Oh, okay. <laughs> Scratch that. Okay, thank you very much. Anyone else for public participation? Seeing then, we'll go to the next agenda item, which is uh, technology curriculum presentation. Dr. Chesson. Uh... Um, it's my pleasure to um, introduce um, Paul McKnight, who's a member of our, the teaching staff at Arlington High School. Oh, and we also have Kirsten, Sil Kirsten Silverman. Perfect. Come on down. Yeah, you're going to okay. start. <laughs> so can you get Kirsten's first? Um, as you are well aware, um, through the generosity of the town and the Capitol Building Committee, um, the Capitol Committee and the Arlington Educational Foundation, we've had a significant um, influx of uh, technology dollars into the district. And uh, this is just are just two examples of the many staff members who are really making 
um, strides at transforming their classrooms through the use of technology in order to better meet the needs of all students. Sure. Um, so I'm Kirsten Solomon, and I'm currently teaching sixth and seventh grade math at the Audison. Um, and so we have iPads for every student in both the sixth grade and seventh grade in our cluster. Hmm. So besides cleaning the filter, is it what? Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Um, so one of the apps that I use often is Google Classroom. Um, and so the nice thing about Google Classroom is that you can um, sort of share with students everything that you want them to do for a day. So this is one example of one day in my classroom when I had some students that needed to practice um, from a quiz and retake a quiz and other students who were um, able to have a choice in what they were doing. They were playing math practice games and then I actually had other students who were doing an extension of a different method for long division. So I had three different activities going on in my classroom at once, and I was able to manage all of them through the use of Google Classroom because the students knew exactly what they needed to do and where to find the materials. Um, so it was all right in one place. Um, and the other really nice thing about Google Classroom is that you can create digital files for students to interact with and then give everyone a copy of the file. So it automatically sends every student that's connected to Google Classroom. Um, a digital copy, and I'm gonna show you on the next slide what this was. So I sent every student a couple slides in with <coughs> explain everything, and students were able to actually, you can't see it that well, use a protractor and measure the angles and label them in explain everything, and they could record their voice and save it at the same time. Um, so it makes thinking, students thinking a lot more visible um, because they don't just have to share their thinking and writing, they can also share it orally. Um, so I could send it out through Google Classroom. Students could take that file, put it and explain everything, and then interact with it. Um, and these are three other, um, they're not apps, but online um, places that I go often to get formative data from students. So Pear Deck is something that we're all using in the sixth grade right now, which is a cross between PowerPoints and the old clickers. And so students, we have slides that we present to students and then students can respond to them. Um, as teachers, we can see in real time how students are answering the questions, which students are struggling, which students we need to work with more. Um, it gives us data that we never had before and it saves everything that students are doing. Um, and then we can actually send it out to them and it creates individual files for each student. So they get the slides and all their answers and they can reflect on those through Google Docs and it all sort of works seamlessly without a lot of work from us, which we really like. Um, another one that I'm using a lot now is, is called GoFormative, which is really nice for math because something we always run into with math is that it's not easy for students to type their answers and so they really need to write them. Um, and that's something that's really nice about the iPad. Students can write right on the screens and so we can see their math symbols, we can see their drawings. Um, and so in GoFormative, it, it can work like a quiz and it can work sort of as giving students feedback um, where students get a question they respond to the question, and again, we can see their answers in real time. The nice thing about GoFormative is they don't have to wait for other students. They can advance to the next question on their own. So it's sort of a cross between Pear Deck and Socrative, which is the last one. So Socrative is, um, again, a student sort of feedback. Um, we're getting formative data from students. Um, it collects all their data, but students advance to the next question pretty quickly. They're usually, um, shorter questions, not something where they are drawing, they're just typing in an answer. So, um, those are the three things I use the most for formative data, which is really nice. Mr. Hainer, uh, let's begin with this last piece right here. Yes. Does, does it self-correct? Um, or does it depend on you? It, Pear Deck does not. Go formative can self-correct, and so if it's a multiple choice, it'll self-correct, or if it's a short answer, it'll self-correct. I'm just concerned when you say that they, they don't have to wait, they can go on, if they've made an error. Right. Do you don't want to reinforce negative well, learning? Well, formative is, Pear Deck, we, 
is something where you don't go on by yourself. So it's more of a whole class. Okay. I'll use that in the middle of a unit. So students will answer a question. We'll look at everyone's answers. We can see everyone's answers anonymously. And then we'll look at, OK, how do we do? Everybody picked right. the same wrong answer. So what are we doing wrong? Where are we making the mistake? Um, formative, you can do it both ways. Okay. So for example, I might use formative for a quick quiz just to see how students are doing. So there, I'm just collecting that data. But I can also have it immediately grade that and tell the students how they're doing. So I might do that right before a quiz. So it works both ways. Thank you. My, my other question, back to the very first slide where you talked about the, the, the multiple yes. things going. How do you manage that? <laughs> well, that's the nice thing about it, is you can sort of say, say to students, OK, you finished this. Now, now you can go on to the next thing. And they know exactly where to go, because it, it keeps it all in one place. So. And it stores this so that you can go back and look at it? Yes. And, and does it go into an individual file for them as well? Yes. Their results. So they, they know where they are individually. You know where they are as a whole group. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Are there any other questions? I talk really fast once I get going. So. Great. Thank you. Right. Thank you. So while we're having Paul get come up and get set up, um, one of the things I want to call to your attention is, uh, so this is... Uh, Kirsten's uh, cluster is half sixth grade, half seventh grade. So not only does she have three things going on in the same time, but she also has two grades, not at the, the grades are not at the same time in the classroom, but she's prepping for two grades and multiple activities with the same, with the same group of students in the class at the same time. It allows her, uh, her to do what we call high ceiling, low floor, so that the, those who are, um, have already mastered the standard um, can get enrichment. Those who are in the middle can practice the standard, and those who are, need some re-teaching um, in order to meet the standard um, can get that at the same time. If, Mr. Hainer? Just a quick question on that. Uh, is this, I know you said sixth and seventh graders, are they in the same class? No, or are they? no. she has two, three classes of sixth graders and two classes of seventh graders. But they have I, the I same four I'm, teachers. <laughs> Okay, I misunderstood. I thought you meant you had two classes in the same in the room no, at the same time. No. Okay, thank she's you. She's good, I'm but sorry. she's not that good. I misunderstood. Good. <laughs> I misunderstood. I was going to say, she is really fantastic <laughs> managing all of that. She's awesome. You are anyway. Okay, thank you. Um, my name is, uh, I'm Paul McKnight. I'm an English teacher at the high school. I teach ninth grade and 11th grade. Uh, a little background before um, explaining how um, I'm using Chromebooks. Um, le one of the the things that we've appreciated so much is the ability to have some input into the tools that we use where uh, other departments um, favored uh, and other le levels have favored um, iPads. We really wanted the Chromebooks. We felt that that really worked um, in the in English language arts and in some of the humanities. Um, a year ago, uh, we had uh, 30 Chromebooks available for distribution uh, among the, the English department. We signed these out. Uh, whenever we wanted to use them in our classrooms. Um, on the basis of the success and the popularity of those, um, we decided, uh, myself, uh, Nicole Edson, and Justin Barasa, two other uh, English teachers, um, ap applied through the grant process and uh, each to have a set of the, of the Chromebooks in our room. So now that we're really starting to pilot some one-on-one -on -one and uh, different uh, uses of, of the devices. Um, this also kind of came about uh, because I participated in the EdTech teacher uh, T21 course last year along with a lot of the other high school uh, teachers which was really great for also introducing us to new apps at the same time um, and so what I'd like to talk about is some of the the different ways that we're we're starting to use these um, and ways that we feel that they're really tr transforming the student learning um, making our lives easier and and essentially also ways that they're that they're not just word processors, that we're learning to, to uh, use them uh, as in, in different types of tools, which I think also came about because of the EdTech teacher course. Um, just an overview before, I want, I want to focus on a particular method I've been trying out with the discussions, but some of the various applications um, that, that these are really useful for. Um, so a big part of that is classroom management, as Christy talked about with the uh, Google Classroom, the ability to um, communicate with students, the ability to send them each a file that they can edit and work on and collect. Um, 
just a, even as a way of submitting and uh, papers and assignments and uh, having those all sort of in one place. That's good for us as teachers. Um, it's also, I think, uh, good for students because many of them, they have several teachers who are all using this, uh, this application. Um, obviously, you would ex expect that we'd be using it for writing, but as you know, uh, the Google Apps have all of the collaborative tools of editing, so, uh, suggesting, commenting. There's even uh, apps for uh, audio commentary <clears throat> as well as uh, written uh, comments. Um, reading, digital reading is, is I, I hadn't really thought about that as uh, even a, a thing in and of itself, but there are ways in which um, we can use certain applications to really transform even the reading. Uh, I'll briefly kind of show you one of those. Uh, th there, there are ways to change the ways that we have uh, discussions in the classroom, which are a staple, and as you know, um, whether it's iPads or Chromebooks, it opens up a lot of tools which have diff students uh, different ways of showing what they are learning. The more, what is making, uh, ramping up the uh, the facility and, and I think the, the rapid increase with which we can use these are the way that the apps themselves are changing. Um, I think what we are finding with the great thing about so many of these um, cloud-based or web-based apps is that you can get to them from anything. Mm -hmm. um, students can even go on their phones and submit an assignment to Google Classroom because it's there or they can go home and work on it. Uh, desktops, laptops, uh, iPads. Um, so they're very convenient, they're very accessible. Most of these apps are now talking to each other, so there's the integration, uh, or many of them are talking to each other. Of course, a benefit for students is that things are not lost, as you were asking, that you know, the work that they do gets saved in many formats and can be saved and is auto-saved, so uh, that's not so great because it gets harder for students to say, the dog ate my homework and, um, because it's, we know it's where it is in the cloud. Um, and uh, this, I, I think that f for student learning, this idea of being able to see what students are, students are thinking, making that thinking visible, um, knowing what they are learning and where they are stuck in ways that we couldn't see before we were making educated guesses or looking at just you know heads but not knowing what was in them. Uh, this is a real uh, wonderful uh, benefit of so many of the applications that we're, we're using. And then, um, as with this particular process, you'll see uh, there's a novelty item, of course, with some of the technology with students, and some of them are just engaging in ways because they are visual, they're dynamic. Uh, and, and, of course, anytime we get students excited or engaged, is, um, you know, they're involved in their learning. Um, I, I, I know, know that you have been introduced or, uh, the, the, to the SAMR model, which we learned about in, in faculty meetings and in the T21 class. Um, and this is this idea of, uh, it, at one point, it'd be very easy just to sort of use these devices to substitute for an old task. And I think, especially in the English classroom, we said, well, you know, we can, you can paper and pencil, or we can still read the books. Why would we want to read it on the Kindle, um, et cetera? Why, you know, do we need to have uh, a, a Chromebook in the classroom instead of going to a lab. Well, I, I hope that I can give you an idea of the, the fact that some of these applications really are letting us do things that we couldn't do before um, and, and enhancing, if not fundamentally changing, learning. Um, I have not used this. I played around with it, but we, I just learned about this from one of the middle school teachers, this program called Actively Learn, and this would be an example. Um, I'm, I'm gonna try to focus on things that I would do in the classroom. Actively Learn is uh, an application, a digital reading application. Um, so what you can do with Actively Learn is, is take from a catalog or embed with your own classic texts and what you can embed here are questions, um, open response questions, short answer questions, multiple choice questions that can act as gatekeepers so that students can work through and then they, they stop when you, when you want them to at a question and ask for that check of comprehension. Um, so if you can imagine, I have a couple of classes of the curriculum A level students and many foreign exchange students in there too who are all reading um, the Scarlet Letter or Huckleberry Finn. I know that these are challenging texts for students. Um, and if you imagine them all um, 
not just in their books, where I don't know if they're reading the books in the classroom, if what they're understanding, but if they're navigating through this online and they're reading and then they come to a question and they have to answer a comprehension question, um, and I can, with, with my device, monitor w um, how they answered. I can see all of their answers to that question. They can progress through as they are. And of course, they could probably open up a browser page and look for the answer, but you know, we'll, um, but I would walk around and make sure that they weren't doing that. But this is an idea of, and, and you, so you can, you can sort of, uh, and you can use this application to actually assign, uh, uh, to push out reading assignments. But it's an example, and of course, they can, they can click on any word and look it up. They can select the text and do text to speech if they want to hear it. And the, you know, these are some of the ways in which um, digital reading is, 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 can be fundamentally uh, have enhancements that the, the, the text itself may not. Of course, I don't expect them to read the whole thing online. I wouldn't want them to. Um, they still have the novels and they can read, read at home. Um, one thing, so something I, I definitely plan to try. Um, so the, the, the very method I'd like to talk about in a little bit more detail is a, is a discussion, uh, a way that I've changed up some of my discussions using several applications. It's, it seems like a long, uh, maybe a cumbersome process. It's amazing how quick uh, this, this is based on the ease the which these applications are changing. Um, so very quickly, an overview. Um, as a reading assignment, um, students uh, read a text, a short story, a couple of chapters. I have a Google form that I just kind of replicate. Maybe once every week I can use this. Um, so that students, uh, f uh, after reading, just uh, there's uh, some uh, places where they can put in questions that they have about, about the reading. Um, and then using an application called Today's Meet, I create on the spot a discussion, a chat room. Um, using the Google Classroom, I can quickly s share a link to that. And then working in groups of three, um, I will use their questions and the students will confer and share their responses using this chat room. So I have some screenshots here just to kind of uh, el elaborate on this. Here's a, here's a shot of what that uh, Google form looks like. I'd like students, um, even though I'm touting technology here, I, I also want to make sure that, that students aren't being asked to spend a lot of time looking at, uh, on a screen as part of their homework. So this is a very brief response. Um, again, I have a copy of this. I can easily replicate it. This is a, a AP class reading a Nathaniel Hawthorne short story. Um, so there's a place for their, them to fill out. And further down, they have options for summarizing the reading in three words, uh, posing a clarification question, and posing discussion questions. We've also worked with uh, as a department on teaching students how to ask better questions and more sophisticated questions. I was using this last year as a way of knowing before the lesson started what my quest students had struggled with, with the reading, and knowing ahead of time what some discussion questions that they might ask um, as opposed to my own, and using those as the basis of class discussion at the same time, that's, a, that's an additional level of preparation and reading before I get into, to, into the classroom. Um, and so it can be a lot to catch up on to make sure you take that extra preparation step, but it's still that idea of like making the thinking visible and the, the formative assessment. Um, here's an example of what that chart populates. Uh, the timestamps show me when students complete the assignment, um, that they've done it on time. Um, the, the second circle here shows some of the words that they would have come up with for the story. I've turned these into those, the word clouds so we can see what are, you know, what are, the big, what are big themes. Um, and then here's the view where I can actually see their discussion questions. This is what I will have, one of the sheet pages that I will have open uh, in class. Once we are in, um, so the, the, I can see if there are clarification questions and then look for trends in the questions that they, that they ask. Um, when class starts, um, you do not need an account for this application, today's meet. Um, you, very quickly, you make a name for your uh, room. You can decide how long you're gonna have the conversation open for. That's as easy as it is to set up. This is what the interface looks like. You enter your name. I ask the students to combine their first names to be a team name. Um, and you have a 140 character box to post a message. 
in the classroom, uh, group students, um, I think the key to this is not one to one, which would be too many voices in the discussion, but three to one. Uh, and, and so then as a team, they are sort of responding to the discussion. While I'm making that chat room, they're logging on, they're, um, someone's checking their email. I can, uh, another feature of Classroom is how quickly you can just send out an email. You've got all your students, so whoever logs on to that Chromebook goes to his or her email, follows the link, um, and then they are, and then this is what happens. So what I found is really useful here is then I'm, I'm moderating the discussion using their questions. So if there's a clarification question, I'll put that out as Q1, um, and, they, and they will respond after a few minutes, post, uh, post another question, um, and I can keep going back to that, uh, that chart, um, but also run with a question depending on still moderating discussion, see where the flow of conversation goes. Prompt for evidence. Um, you can see that there's uh, several quotes here. This is when I was, uh, that we had good answers but not enough evidence. Um, and then you, have, you see students here working as a group going back to the short story. Um, and what they're, you know, so they are having really two levels of discussion. Um, we could, I could take their questions and I could throw these out as class, class discussion questions, but you've got one student talking at a time. Here you could have 21 students talking at a time. Or I could have them do work in small groups, but then, yes, they're all talking at a time, but there's no central class discussion that they're all contributing to or that, that I am keeping track of. So I can see what they're, what they're thinking. Um, and, then, and, and that's essentially sort of how it runs. Um, another advantage of this uh, of application is um, it creates a transcript of the entire conversation. I find that this works best if it runs for about 25 minutes or so, not an entire period. But it's amazing how much you have here. Um, and here's you know, some students working from what is the central symbol here to this central question um, of is it better that we come clean ab about the, the, the sins that we have within us or uh, keep them uh, buried. And you can see that there's different points of view and it nicely uh, set up a closing discussion. Um, I, and, and there are things you could do with that transcript, provide it, have students go back and read through it, pick out ideas, write about those ideas. Um, and, and this can be a, also a, sec, a pre, precursor to an, uh, an actual follow-up class discussion. So there is still that level of participation. I, I have done this with all of my classes. I've asked them what they have thought the, the, uh, about it. The, the feedback has been entirely positive. They feel it is very engaging. Um, they like it. It's fun. If, if you walk in, they're, have, they're having a, a, a good time, but we're talking about the, the, the stories. Um, the students have pointed out that this is less intimidating for the students that might otherwise refrain um, from speaking up in class. They have the, op they have the benefit of conferring with other students, um, and which helps clarify their thinking. At the same time, they can see what other people in the class are thinking, um, and they all have felt that, that they've walked away with a better understanding um, of what it is that, uh, of what, it, we have, what we've been reading. Um, so that's, that's basically the process, just like, one of many tools we could be using. Uh, Dr. Seuss. Uh, oh yes, I have a, a few sort of just question, clarification questions, yeah. and I'm gonna throw them all together because sure. they're all just about a picture of the classroom. Um, so I'm just sort of curious, how many teachers are using these um, methods? Um, how often? Um, also questions about, are they all using Chromebooks? Are some of them using their own devices? Um, just sort of just a picture of what it looks like across. Right, the so um, I would say, sir, in, in the English department, I would say that uh, probably over, over half of the department are, are using Chromebooks on a fairly regular basis. Again, there are three of us who, who have the, the, those in our room and we use them all the time, but other people are constantly asking to borrow them. Um, the extent of which they are using them for, for apps like these has, is, is very, we're in the process of, of um, other people are trying this particular method. They might be using, um, I, I think it works when we, when we talk to each other and other people take on the ideas. So um, I know several teachers have used that similar type of Google form for reading responses. They've been using Today's Meet for uh, 
what we call a back channel in, during uh, Socratic seminars mm -hmm. types of things. Um, and, and, for, for other, uh, and for other tools instead, I think most, uh, probably two thirds of the teachers are using Classroom as a management tool. Uh, and I think just sort of getting their feet wet, I think, with, with, with these different applications. So I think that the, the, you know, the, level of, uh, the level of exposure and integration is growing, but varies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And are, are there any bring your own device type of things, or is this oh, yeah, only? Oh yes. yeah, sorry, um, not, not really, not yet. I, I know there was I, some talk experimenting. I'm not sure mm -hmm. if we've rolled it out yet, or? That's yeah. at the middle school. Uh, bring your own device? Yes. At the high school? <laughs> no, we, we started at the middle school this year. This, oh, there's a few we, people that get on the high school, but not very many. Oh, okay. I, I, I've been, yeah. The principal had made an announcement saying, yeah. last year saying that it was going to be high school. We've been, we've been talking about it as like this, this is being kind of like one step towards that. What would it look like if mm -hmm. you know, we took these, um, if, if uh, we had each had some of these <laughs> devices and then we had students to bring in? I think one of the things that we found, I, as I said, students, students <laughs> can use their phones for right, some of right. these devices, certainly to tweet 140 characters, but mm -hmm. but at the same time they wouldn't be able to see a screen where you can see the whole conversation, um, and it's still you know so we I think we're still trying to figure out what that might look like. Okay, great. Thanks. Uh, Mr. Th uh, Thielman. Thank you. This is a great presentation. Mm -hmm. I'm just trying to get a picture of what the classroom looks like. I saw, I saw the. The, 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 I don't know what slide it is, but there's a slide in there with, <clears throat> yeah, so three yeah, students three, around three. one Chromebook, yep. and then you, you project on a screen, is that what you do, or? You can, I, I haven't. You don't, okay. I, I, no, I'm, I'm, I've got my own, I'm watching my own, for, I've, I'm my own screen, I'm watching the conversation, going back to their questions, and going back to see how the conversation is. You can have it on a screen, there's no need to in this case, because they're, they're all looking at the Oh, they're looking at the same. Yeah, they're all looking at the same conversation. Okay, so there, you have three, and it's, it's three kids around a Chromebook. Yeah. I get them. Yeah, thank you. Mr. Hainer? I think this is fantastic, and as a retired teacher, I envy you both uh, with these awesome tools that you have. One minor question. The literature you're using is 18th century literature. <laughs> is your dictionary giving them those definitions? That's the, a very good question. The reason I, haven't, yeah. the reason I ask is I had a, an exchange student from Japan, and she was in an AP class and she was dealing with early 18th century language and all she had was a 20, at that time, a 20th century dictionary and it was not serving her yeah. well. So just something to think, it's a minor thing. I yeah, mean, no, it's, it's a great point with the, uh, especially with the, yeah, the, the, inter, the dictionaries built into the uh, digital reading programs, yeah. Do, do, is it a, what, which level of dictionary is, do you I know? I have to find out, I'll let you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Allison Ampey. Thank you. Um, so I, I see the last slide that has the student feedback, and I saw that the advantage of having the, the transcript of the conversation, but I'm just wondering why else is this better than just having discussion, you know, open-ended with all the kids talking? Well, I certainly still do that and do, do plenty of that. I think it, I, in, in, Again, in, in this case, when you're having when you're having a class discussion, it can, you know, you've got one per, you've got one kid talking at the time. Um, you may have three or four students who have their hands up, ready to talk, and seven or eight who are listening, and nine or ten who look like they're listening and <laughs> not really present. And and so, uh, I think that idea of in, in, I've always tried to engage as many of them at the same time as I as, as I could, and uh, so I, I think it's it's better in that. And as I said, the other alternative is well, just put them in groups and have them talk about the questions in, in their small groups. And I do plenty of that as well. Um, I think again, what this does is allow me to uh, them to also to be having a class discussion together, and me to moderate that class discussion. And really see what and be and respond to it by follow up questions, probing for evidence, guide it a, a little bit. Um, so I think it's getting more of the students thinking through the questions I want them to be thinking about. Great, thank you, Mr. Thielman. Oh, this is the first year we're using this, so we don't have any data data to show if there's an improvement in grades or other assessments yet. 
Right, right. So I, I think I think that that will be that's something I'm definitely looking at. So this is this is largely about um, understand, you know, look like get uh, in terms of the standards we're looking at, it's in co comprehension, understanding. Um, a lot of this is about probing for better evidence and explaining those things. So it'll be interesting to see to follow up. Um, for me, the, assess the assessment that matters is when, when they write essays, um, yeah. how sophisticated are their ideas, how much of the evidence uh, do they come back to use. So this is the first quarter we're using this, right? So, yeah. so you have no real, so do you have any, do you have a sense, is it, is it your instincts telling you anything or it's too early to tell? Um, they, as, anecdotally, I mean, I, again, I think the, the higher level of engagement in the class has is is has I'm I'm has to be benefiting their their uh, their understanding of the text. Um, they say that they understand more. I, I've been posting a question of like what what has your group learned um, from this discussion today? And it's it's the, the things they're posting are very insightful. Um, so I'll. But I'll be looking for that to see what. All right. Yeah, thanks. thanks a, a, the thank committee you. did get a report last. Uh, many of these techniques were also used by the 610 cluster that did the one to one pilot last year. And the committee did get a report last year from that cluster that gave some evidence of uh, increased student achievement, particularly time in learning. Um, uh, there was uh, something like 12 or 13 additional hours that people had gotten in math last year because of the work that they were doing. Um, but the thing I also want to caution, and actually Mr. McKnight and I were having a quest, uh, conversation about this beforehand, is that um, I actually asked him to come because he was being observed for as part of the teacher evaluation system. And the director came to me and she said, I, I didn't know what to do. I said, what do you mean? She said, I'm, I'm, I'm you know, I, I didn't know what to do. I went into the classroom and all the kids were working and the teacher was conferring with somebody and the kids were working in small groups and some kids were working by themselves and there was nothing up on the board and how did they know what to do? So I went over to a kid and I said, so how do you know what to do? And they brought up Google Classroom and they say, see, if we're going to do this and then we're supposed to do this and then we're supposed to do that. And she just said, boy, the world has changed. So if we keep trying to, this is a different, definite mm -hmm. paradigm shift. And I think that we need to be cautious to not use an older paradigm to determine what success is. Yeah. Well, if they're all engaged, that's usually a step in the right direction. You should get a good evaluation mm -hmm. if they're all engaged. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Seuss. Actually, I was wondering if um, Dr. Chesson could speak about um, our plans for the future in terms of so what's going what seventh grade going to look like, for example? What's going to happen at the high school? Uh, we're in the process of um, uh, setting up the capital budget request for next mm -hmm. year. A lot of what um, will happen will be depending on that. Dependent on that, um, we've so shown some good interest in parents at the sixth grade level for mm -hmm. participating in BYOD. Um, the more parents that would participate in that, the more quickly we'd be able to spread things throughout the other other grades at the school. Mm -hmm. um, We've put Chromebooks in and iPads in seventh and eighth grade. I'm waiting to get feedback from those teachers as to which okay. device they will ultimately prefer. Mm -hmm. Again, at the high school level, the teachers could pick, and depending on the subject area, mm -hmm. um, and also the availability of um, biology really wanted iPads because of a book that they wanted of um, uh, the ability to do uh, online labs, um, simulations mm -hmm. of dissections, et cetera. Um, they really wanted to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. so. We'll have to look and see whether it's by department or, um, but but that's definitely BYOD is so, the way we're looking to go. Okay, so then uh, actually the BYOD is confusing to me because I know in sixth grade you can bring something but only a certain kind of iPad, right? So, and I remember last year at the high school they were saying that they were experimenting with the idea of students bringing different platforms right. and, and and seeing if that would work. Is right, that and, we're, and we're, we're continuing, I mean, little by little, a student, if a student comes to the tech office and asks to have their device put on the network at the high school, mm -hmm. we'll let them do that, but we didn't openly s solicit that. So we um, may not be experimenting with that as much. Uh, as not we, as much, okay. but however, the teachers at the high school, um, particularly the, the class that Mr. McKnight talked about, mm -hmm. um, really is a, a course in how to use technology on um, device independent so a lot of web-based tools mm -hmm. um, so it really wouldn't make any difference which device the teacher uh, the students brought in mm -hmm. but we didn't really want to stress the teachers out any more than they're already Got it. stressed okay. out okay. so that's Thanks. why we we kept it to one device in a classroom right okay. now Great. so why do uh, utopias need prisons <laughs> <laughs> I love the question. I, I was just sitting there watching that slide go by. I said, 
I, I'd, yeah. I'd love to hear what uh, students have to say about that. It's really fascinating. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you, slide <laughs> no, 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 I wouldn't have asked the question that way. Right. Slide 16 showed a picture. Uh, is this your classroom? This, this one? Yeah. Yes. That's a partition? It, 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 is, a, it is a partition, yeah. That's How's a, that working for classroom? you? Another <laughs> classroom? What's on the other side? The prison. Oh, the prison. <laughs> No, seriously, I mean, we, you know, we're talking about Classic. facilities in the high school and uh, seeing that we have somebody who's actually working in the building. Th this, was act th this was actually old, old hall in the, in the high school. I think at one point it might have been divided into two rooms. Mm -hmm. um, and it was actually Stacy Kitsis, the current uh, librarian, um, who we, uh, we created that, it, we, we turned that into a classroom when we, were, when we needed the room. Uh, she was the one that actually wanted uh, to create that not only a classroom but also a, a, a meeting room, mm -hmm. um, hence the seminar tables, and it was one of the first rooms in the school that had a ceiling-mounted and still the only one of the few only ones that has a ceiling-mounted projector. Mm -hmm. um, and then the partitions were set up because um, the room could be shared, so there could be. I think there were two teachers. Mm -hmm. The one had desks behind there. So um, yeah, and, and from what I understand, the English department has some of the best rooms in the school. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> okay. Not all with cubicle dividers. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, any other questions? Just, uh, uh, one thing starts. I noticed um, is, uh, and only because I'm worrying about this about my own students as well, um, the time stamps on when these students put their stuff in. I'm noticing 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, 12:08 in the morning. Mm -hmm. We got to talk to them about that. Yeah. They should be asleep at 08 on 1 6, 11 Agreed. 6. <laughs> um, by the way, uh, just saying. Yeah. <laughs> I never. I know it's not your fault. No, no. I'm not in any way saying yes. it's a bad thing. But We're collecting is, data you know, and opening also, cans of worms. Right, no, but I know we are doing the same thing at our school. We're noticing that more and more as we have more things and kids are checking them in online and we see kids submitting homework at 10, 11, 12 o'clock at night. We're having, the, those are also having, it's good because we're starting to have those conversations about what are you doing at midnight mm -hmm. posting your homework? Like, come on, go to bed. Most times the students have a, a, a post, whether it's a discussion post or any kind of online post, I usually give them two or three days notice. I usually <laughs> don't like, I, I usually don't like to say, here's something I like you to post by tomorrow. Right. Um, rare. So. That's on them. Uh, even with two or three days to, the, they're know, they're still posting time, at the last but minute. Yeah, but yes, know, right? it, it is. Ugh. That's another little piece of uh, information we didn't have before. But yeah, suspected. exactly. I think it's very interesting information. Great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next order of business will be the superintendent's annual evaluation. Uh, I just want to remind uh, the committee, and probably more than just the committee, um, the, the public, that uh, this is a string in the accountability network for the district um, and for any good public school system. Uh, the fact that uh, the superintendent is accountable to this committee and this committee is accountable to the voters of Arlington who review our work. This is one of the most important things we do. And this committee has taken this assignment, uh, as always, very seriously. Um, one of the things is, is that we are operating under the relatively new state evaluation system. And I was at a conference uh, today and yesterday pertaining to educator evaluation. And uh, I think the analogy is that it's a rather rigid system and it feels like a new pair of boat shoes and until you break them in and get them loose and, and, and move uh, off the rigid dot the I's cross the T's into where everybody's comfortable with the thing, um, I don't think we're going to be in the proper place and one of the things that you'll notice when we get through here is that we were hanging up on the superintendent goals uh, and there was some variance between the members in terms of how we set that up and did that evaluation. Uh, <clears throat> I tried to bring commonality in, into the concatenated document, uh, but I think that just 
a note for the future chair of the committee, Dr. Seuss, is that the one thing we should be doing uh, when we do this next year is pre-populate the superintendent's goals within the form uh, before it is passed out to the committee so that we're all on the same playing field. Uh, other, other than that, uh, I, I think <coughs> uh, th th there was a lot of th uh, thought uh, uh, pertaining to the instrument, and Mr. Hainer asked to uh, make a remark before we proceed. Thank you. What I'm about to say relates to me and not a statement on my fellow members. In order for me to be objective evaluating the superintendent, I relied on the evidence that the superintendent provided and limited my evaluation to the evidence the superintendent gave the committee. This evidence does not relate specifically to each of the subcategories in each area, therefore I did not rate them. I provided an overall rating for each topic. Thank you. Okay. <coughs> Any other comments before we get started? Now, uh, uh, Dr. Allison Ampey. Can you just explain how you're going to go about this? That's uh, exactly what I'm about to do. Um, what I have done is I have prepared a summary document by which I have concatenated the individual responses of all members of the committee. This will be the official document going forth and the documents that you submitted to, the, uh, uh, to uh, Karen and myself will remain as ev evidence as well as part of the do official document. But this is going to be the public document that uh, is most readily available to people. I have tried to be very faithful in terms of representing everybody's viewpoint on this and concatenating everything reasonably. What we are going to do is I'm going to, uh, we are going to start on page six of the concatenation. Concatenation, that is a good word. I love that word, yeah, it's one of my favorite words. Let me, let me finish the explanation and then I'll enter, entertain questions. We're going to start with uh, standard one, we're going to work through the four standards, then we're going to come back to the uh, superintendent's goals and then the overall. Uh, the thing that I want to do through this is to first, before I read off the subscores and the overall scores in each area, is to check with you to make sure that you agree and verify the, uh, the ratings that I've put forth here, uh, representing the ratings that you inscribed in your individual forms. Uh, at the conclusion of this, I will uh, place in, uh, something in the overall com uh, column. Now, unfortunately, or fortunately for what it is, is that uh, what you say in this part of the meeting becomes part of the public record for the superintendent's evaluation. We have traditionally limited ourselves to reading the comments that you have made in your evaluation document as Karen will need to revise the words within this if you say something new within the process. You do not need to read all of your comments for it to remain because this is the public document, but I would invite everyone to read the comments that you made under each uh, standard and in the overall summary allowed uh, so it is a visual uh, record that people who are watching the meeting can understand where we're at. Um, are there any questions about how we will proceed? Um, hearing none, Dr. Allison Ampey, did you have a question or a comment? A comment. Can you just fix my name in the column? <laughs> uh, oh, okay. Uh, yeah, we're short in L, aren't we? I apologize. Okay. And then it just repeated itself through the whole thing. Uh, I did this about, you know those time stamps? Okay. Uh, standard one is instructional leadership. There are five sub areas, standard one, and I will uh, note how people evaluated over the sub areas and then the overall ratings. For uh, Mr. Hainer did not r uh, rate any of the sub areas. Uh, among the rest of us on curriculum, uh, all rated the superintendent proficient with the exception of Mr. Thielman, who rated the superintendent exemplary. On 1B instruction, all rated the superintendent pr uh, proficient. On 1C assessment, uh, Dr. Allison Ampey rated the superintendent needs improvement. Dr. Seuss rated the superintendent exemplary. The rest rated proficient. Uh, for evaluation, uh, uh, 
Mr. Pierce rated the superintendent needs improvement. Uh, Ms. Starks did not rate that. Uh, the rest rated it proficient. Data informed decision making. Uh, Dr. Seuss and uh, Mr. Thielman rated the superintendent exemplary. The rest rated proficient. Uh, for the overall rating, the six members, uh, uh, with the exception of Mr. Hainer, rated the superintendent proficient. Mr. Hainer rated the superintendent unsatisfactory. Does this reading reflect your views? Yes. Okay, fine. We are going to go in alphabetical order uh, and read through the documents. We'll start with, uh, Mr. P uh, by the way, Mr. Th uh, Mr. Pierce is not with us tonight, so Mr. Thielman will be reading Mr. Thiel uh, Mr. Pierce's part. Uh, Dr. Allison Ampey. My comment applies to all standards. Although evidence supplied did not always speak to requirements, I base my assessment not just on it, but also on my observations of material presented in school committee meetings, et cetera. I would recommend in the future that significantly better evaluation evidence be provided to enable clear-cut proof of district work. For example, um, see the DESI provided suggestions at the bottom of the uh, forms. Mm -hmm. I, I can show you later where they are. It's, it's mm -hmm. on the form that we have. Um, 1C was marked as needed, needs improvement because we didn't have any evidence about it. Okay, thank you. Mr. Hainer is next. Um, the superintendent provided seven uh, documents for evidence in this uh, standard. Uh, one of them I, uh, was a document from uh, Department of Elementary and Secondary Education and does not support how the superintendent accomplishes uh, the goal. Another document was the Alice Spring 2015. It was a schedule of initial rollout of the Alice program. It lacked follow-up to show the goal had been accomplished by using summary statements of each event. Uh, the next document was an administrative team meeting, uh, a listing of agendas for administrative team meetings for the year. It lacked follow-up to show the goal had been accomplished. Another one was a list of agendas for administrative team meeting, again, lacking follow-up. Uh, there was a project-based learning conference done. Uh, it was an email to the, super, uh, for, to the superintendent inviting the teachers. Uh, this was uh, very satisfactory uh, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, the last was a, uh, an exhibit uh, chart showing the scheduled visits for the superintendent to the schools throughout the year. The superintendent was told last year for this to have any meaning, a simple one or two line summary about each visit would show the value of this visit. Thank you, Mr. Pierce. So I'm reading for Mr. Pierce. Yes. <clears throat> I feel that Dr. Bodie has performed proficiently in standard one, instructional leadership. As a parent, I have seen the types of curriculum that my children are exposed to. I have learned as a school committee member that the systems and <clears throat> frameworks are in place and are utilized to allow for a strong 21st century education for all Arlington students. I believe because I have witnessed and seen evidence of that, Dr. Bodie, along with Dr. Chesson, used data from DDMs and MCAS results to inform a K through 12 educational growth plan and a vision for the district. Mm -hmm. I remain unsure that evaluations are done timely, and this may be due to a lack of hours and resources rather than anything else, and therefore I mark D as needs, in, uh, one D as needs improvement. Um, it's my turn. There is significant evidence of proficiency in the area of instructional leadership. The district's efforts to reorganize the elementary school schedule in order to provide more professional development and common planning time is a recognition of the value of the practice in Arlington. It is significant that the realignment of the schedule was supported by the teachers and union officials were also described this change as supporting their efforts to provide quality instruction for our children. Having attended the summer meetings with principals and administrative staff, there is considerable evidence that the superintendent infuses administrative meetings with content that pertains to the continuous improvement of curriculum and instruction. Presentations of the school committee by department heads have also shown an understanding of standards, and they work strategically to improve teaching and learning in the district. Professional development in the district is differentiated based on the needs and interests of our teachers as evidenced by the offerings of our full-day professional development days. 14 of 16 administrators responded in the superintendent's questionnaire that the superintendent is proficient at giving effective and timely supervision and evaluation. Data use and presentations before the school committee are adequate for a high-performing district. Growth scores still lag in certain schools and grade levels among high-need students, 
a focus that is being addressed by the superintendent. Ms. Starks. From everything I have seen and read, Dr. Bodie is strong in her instructional leadership in our district. She has helped our district to grow and enabled better teaching and decision making through the implementation of systems that allow teachers and staff to gather and analyze data to inform their practice. I did not have enough evidence to make a rating on 1D evaluation. Dr. Seuss. For two of these categories, assessment and data driven informed decision making, it is my judgment that the superintendent's work is exemplary. The DDMs, district determined measures, we have seen are impressive, though I believe that the material in Novus is from the prior evaluation year. The commitment to PLCs, professional learning communities, and the goal of using some of the time afforded by the elementary level half day for interpreting data shows a clear commitment to data informed decision making. One area for which I would have liked to see more evidence is our commitment to experiential learning. I know that this is a goal of ours, but the only evidence we have seen that we are committed to this goal is a brief student directed video about one particular project. In the future, I would like to see what we're doing at each grade level. For our summative assessments, the MCAS, Arlington remains a high achieving district with impressive growth scores. However, we can do more for our high need students. At only one school, Audison was our median SGP, student growth percentages for ELA, English language arts, <laughs> above 50% for our high need students. On the other hand, our median SGPs in math for high needs students was exemplary, especially at the high school. Mr. Thielman. <clears throat> Not only for myself. Yes. <clears throat> Fostering an environment in which teachers can reflect on their practice and collaborate with colleagues to improve their teaching has been a hallmark of Dr. Bodie's instructional leadership. We have very strong professional development in the Arlington Public Schools. There's a lot of attention to data analysis. DDMs were administered and reviewed at most levels, and schedules were modified to allow more common planning time for teachers. In addition, the staff survey of Dr. Bodie's work and instructional leadership corroborates her self-reporting in this area. There is good use of data in the district. Staff appreciates the scheduling changes, and most of her staff feels that she has created an environment of high expectations and results. While the MCAS results continue to be strong overall, there were some concerns that I encouraged the district to address, including SGPs below 50% in ELA in the Bishop fourth grade, Brackett fifth grade, Thompson fifth grade, and in math in the Hardy fourth grade. Uh, and in math in the Hardy fourth grade, Thompson fourth grade, Brackett fifth grade, and Stratton fifth grade. In addition, district-wide SGP did not meet 50% for 10th graders in ELA. I understand from our last meeting that the assistant superintendent is reviewing this data with teachers and principals, and this may lead to changes in instruction. I would caution against overreacting to this data, but I hope and trust that it is taken into account as we assess ways to improve. Okay, thank you, and as a result, the overall score for standard one, all subscores, and the overall rating would be proficient. Number two, standard two, management and operations. There are five standards and an overall rating. Mr. Hainer did not rate on the individual subscores. Uh, 2A, environment. Uh, Dr. Allison Ampey rated needs improvement. Dr. Seuss rated exemplary. The rest of the committee rated as proficient, again, excluding Mr. Hainer, who did not rate the subscores. Uh, 2B, Human Resources Management and Development, uh, I rated the superintendent exemplary, the rest rated proficient. 2C, Scheduling and Management Information Systems, uh, Dr. Allison Ampey, uh, Dr. Seuss, and Mr. Thielman rated as exemplary, the other three members rated proficient. Law, Ethics, and Policies, uh, Dr. Allison Ampey and myself rated it as needs improvement, the, the other four rated as proficient. Uh, fiscal systems, I rated as needs improvement, the rest rated as proficient. All members of the committee, with the exception <coughs> of uh, Mr. Hainer, rated the superintendent overall as proficient. Mr. Hainer rated unsatisfactory. Uh, are there any um, uh, revisions or corrections to this uh, rubric? Seeing none, the overall rating in all sub areas and the overall rating for the superintendent is proficient. Dr. Allison Ampey. Um, see comment in standard number one. Um, 2A was marked not needs improvement because of the confusing rollout of the Stratton re renovation rehousing. It would have been much preferable to have all solutions on the table during discussion so that parents would know about them and also to provide more information why the original so suggested solution was educationally, educationally reasonable and acceptable. 2C was marked exemplarily because of the recommended change to the elementary schedule and expected improvements to teacher 
professional development and thus the student learning. Thank you. Mr. Hainer. Uh, the superintendent provided two documents in support of this standard. The first was an executive summary uh, for the Allegheny Public School population enrollment. Dr. McKib McKibben's report on enrollment projections. This report was long overdue after relying on figures from a non-professional in the area of demography. These projections could have been foreseen by talking to local realtors as members of the committee suggested over the past three years. This last statement was confirmed by Dr. McKibben stating just that in his presentation. The second piece was the Alice Spring, uh, it was a copy of the Alice initial rollout schedule. I've already addressed that in my prior statement. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Thielman will read for Mr. Pierce. I am pleased with the negotiations with our many unions and that we were able to complete these satisfactorily within one school year. Dr. Bodie suggested that we move in a collaborative fashion via an IBB approach and it worked to everyone's liking. I am impressed with Dr. Bodie's knowledge of the law and her willingness to check with counsel regularly on issues that require legal support. I feel that her grasp on budgetary matters is strong and her cooperation with the CFO works well for the district. The Stratton relocation plan for the remodeling of the school was approved by the school committee a few months ago and Dr. Bodie deserves a lot of credit in getting it moving smoothly and quickly. The move to Novus for meetings has been successful and helps to eliminate the need for wasteful paper copying. I am pleased with the superintendent's goal to make a robust parent satisfaction survey with the help of the community relations subcommittee. This will inform the district in moving forward with what the community wants to see for its educational system. Thank you. Uh, it's my turn now. The superintendent's effort to work with the committee and our collective bargaining units to successfully conclude contract negotiations was exemplary. The use of IBB, which is interest-based bargaining, in the context of a strong relationship and mutual respect, enabled the district to come to a settlement that moves us towards parity with like communities and with adjustments to the elementary workday. The district, with the budget subcommittee, uh, the district provides a substantive orientation program for new teachers. The superintendent works effectively with the school committee and with the budget subcommittee as we develop a budget that is aligned with the stated priorities of the school committee. This work is supported by the superintendent's prior participation in the district governance program. The superintendent has openly acknowledged errors pertaining to the awarding of stipends and worked with the committee to include contractual hourly rates into the collective bargaining agreements. Care should be taken to fully comply with district policies rather than relying on past practice. Ms. Starks. Management and operations is a strength of Dr. Bodie's and I think she does an excellent job of leading by example in this area. Dr. Seuss. During this past year, the superintendent has paid a great deal of attention to safety, health, and emotional and social needs. The rollout and implementation of the Alice Protocol at Bishop Otteson in the high school is a welcome step to improving safety at our schools. Our commitment to retaining social workers in our elementary schools, even after the success grant money was exhausted, is a reflection of the value we put on the social and emotional needs of our students. Implementation and training in a variety of social emotional programs, including open circle, positive reinforcement, responsive classroom, and various advisory programs is welcome. I think it is worth exploring whether we should adopt a single district-wide social emotional program so that everyone is speaking the same language. Teachers have the opportunity to learn from and collaborate with each other. The new elementary school schedule was explicitly designed to give teachers more time for peer level interaction and collaboration. Our constrained finances has forced us to look inward for professional development training, which may be more valuable than looking outward to the experts. Our approach has the added benefit of creating opportunities for leadership and development of our staff. On understanding and complying with laws, agreements, and ethical guidelines, the superintendent, to my knowledge, is doing her job. There are, however, process level problems when it comes to areas that involve school committee oversight. Last year, several important items were presented to the school committee for a vote at the last minute, which effectively meant that the school committee's oversight was bypassed. For example, our district goals end up not reflecting the thoughts of the committee at the retreat. With no time to talk to each other in open meeting before our last scheduled meeting, we were forced to adopt only a schematic version of our goals. More egregious, the contracts for the CFO and assistant superintendent were negotiated with minimal school committee involvement. Afterward, the claim was made that the school committee had made decisions that were in fact made exclusively by the superintendent. With regard to fiscal systems, we all recognize that our budget is stretched thin. Arlington's per pupil spending is less than the state average and less than the communities to which we compare ourselves to. I commend the superintendent's attempts to save money wherever possible, 
whether it bringing the special education services in-house, collaborating with the town and joint facilities develop department, or consolidating financial responsibilities. I also commend the superintendent for depositing money to our special or to the town special education reserve fund last year. Thank you, Mr. Thielman. I applaud the superintendent for hiring substitutes to provide coverage for elementary teachers to participate in data team meetings for restructuring the middle and high school schedules to allow teachers to meet during department common planning time and providing support to data teams to analyze student performance data and to monitor design and modify lesson plans to support all learners. In addition, mathematics coaches at the <coughs> level provided in classroom coaching sessions with classroom teachers with the intent of providing the transition to the common core. Thank you. We now move on to standard three, family and community engagement. There are four sub areas and an overall rating. Again, Mr. Hainer did not rate in the sub areas. On uh, 3A engagement, uh, Dr. Allison Ampey rated his needs improvement. Mr. Thielman is exemplary. The other uh, members uh, rated proficient. Um, sharing responsibility, all members rated proficient. Communication, all members rated proficient. Family concerns, uh, Dr. Allison Ampey, Mr. Pierce, Dr. Seuss rated his needs improvement, myself, Ms. Starks, and Mr. Thielman rated as proficient. For an overall rating, all members rated as proficient with the exception of Mr. Hainer, who rated needs improvement. Uh, overall, uh, are there any um, uh, corrections? Seeing none. Uh, I declare the overall rating and the subscores as being proficient. Uh, Dr. Allison Ampey. Um, C comment in standard one. On standard 3A, I wrote needs improvement because I just don't know what was done toward that objective. On 3D, I felt some parental concerns, for example, with the Stratton rebuild rehousing concerns were not addressed in a timely fashion. Mr. Hainer. There, was, uh, there were 10 pieces of evidence provided by the superintendent. Several of them were basically uh, calendars with no supporting evidence of uh, how this goal was achieved. Um, the, another piece was uh, called Design of the Website. This exhibit uh, is a copy of pages from a commercial web page design from the internet. Uh, it, I, it was referring to AC uh, in, the, in the standard. I had no way of understanding that. Uh, there was another one on the uh, document referring to the school committee agenda. It does not support the goal. Um, the, the, let me, there was, that was repeated twice. Uh, there was a link to the superintendent's newsletter, which is excellent and uh, is something that both the public and the school committee benefit from. I commend her on that. And uh, the last piece was a timeline required regarding website changes. Uh, this was well done, but continually refers to notes that, you, that should have been attached. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Thielman will read for Mr. Pierce. It is most difficult for one single person to continuously collaborate, but Dr. Bodie does as much as one can reasonably expect of a superintendent. She meets regularly with the town manager, numerous town committees, and with CPAC, and attends and participates in all school committee meetings and almost all subcommittee meetings. She is often seen at events at schools and sends out monthly newsletters to parents and guardians. Sometimes I wish that she was able to get back to families and community members in a more efficient manner, and my suggestion would be to have a director of communications that would allow for an immediate response if the query or concern was, re or concern was received and a reasonable period for the superintendent to get back in touch. That is why I marked a needs improvement in the 3D standard. Um, the superintendent has built an infrastructure and expectation for communication with parents in the community. The district uses a phone system and school email lists in order to communicate with families, as well as notifying parents about emergencies or unusual occurrences in the schools. I feel confident that when I refer a parental or community request to the superintendent that it will be responded to in a professional and courteous manner. Given the constraints of our budget and facilities, the superintendent is put in a position where she frequently needs to say no to parents, and the superintendent responds with a calm demeanor and a well-reasoned explanation. I will note that one of the superintendent's great strengths is his, her ability to maintain calm perspective in the midst of a challenging or emotional argument. 
The superintendent has been proactive in presenting evidence to the community and key decision makers pertaining to the intense facility needs being faced by the district. Ms. Starks. While I believe that Dr. Bodie is proficient in this area, I would like to see in next year's goals more work on how to better engage the community in solutions and improving, not just getting information out to the community and parents, but collecting it and taking in suggestions. The improvements to the district website now need to filter down to individual schools so that information on each school's website is easily found and parents can easily navigate from one school to another. We need to have more public forums on the schools, the curriculum, and changes in education to educate and bring in parents and community members. Dr. Seuss. Communication by the superintendent has improved in recent years. The superintendent's monthly newsletter is a valuable source of information for many families. According to a recent survey, families felt welcome in their child's classroom, engaged in the community. 89% of parents said that they are kept up to date on school activities and events. 78% that the school information is commuted effectively, and 85% said that they know how to get school information when they need it. The superintendent's effort to better organize the district website and to create visual representations of data throughout da through dashboards is laudable. A continuing area of concern is that families do not always receive timely responses to their inquiries. It would be helpful if there were a process to handle routine parental inquiries, which may involve empowering additional staff members to answer on behalf of the superintendent. As our district grows, it will become increasingly difficult for the superintendent to personally answer all communication from parents. The superintendent could do more to assuage parental concerns in times of high stress. For example, when Stratton's second grade parents were worried about housing their 2B fourth grade children at Audison, the superintendent could have done a better job at listening to their concerns. Parents do understand that hard choices need to be made, even if they do not like those choices. As a public face of the school district, the superintendent has a responsibility to treat parental concerns seriously and to be honest about our decision-making process. Mr. Thielman. The superintendent has created a district-wide culture in which families are welcome in schools and able to contribute to the classroom where appropriate. Communication has improved dramatically in recent years. The monthly newsletter and Dr. Bodie's frequent presence at town-wide events has helped to improve communication between the school district and the community. I urge the superintendent to hold a forum on the Common Core Standards in Math and ELA after the State Board of Education takes its vote on a new test for Massachusetts students. Improvements on the website went a long way towards improving communication, and I look forward to the completion of the district dashboard. We now move on to standard four, professional culture. There are six sub-areas and an overall rating. Again, Mr. Hainer did not rate any of the sub-areas. <coughs> The description of the ratings for the sub-areas will be for the other six members. Um, for commitment to high standards, uh, myself, Dr. Seuss, and Mr. Thielman rated the superintendent as exemplary. Uh, Dr. Allison Ampey, Mr. Pierce, and Ms. Starks uh, rated her proficient. For cultural proficiency, Dr. Allison Ampey did not rate. The rest rated proficient. For communication, Dr. Allison Ampey and Mr. Pierce rated needs improvement, the rest proficient. Uh, for continuous learning, uh, all, all six members rated proficient. I know for, Dr. Oh, Thielman. Oh, oh, well, did I, oh I, I'm sorry, I missed that. Mr. Thielman, I'm sorry, rated exemplary, the rest rated proficient. Uh, for shared vision, uh, Dr. Seuss rated needs improvement, the rest rated proficient. Managing conflict, uh, Dr. Allison Ampey and Dr. Seuss rated needs improvement, the rest rated proficient. For an overall rating of proficient by all members with the exception of Mr. Heiner, who rated uh, needs improvement for an overall rating in all sub areas and for an overall rating of proficient, Dr. Allison Ampey. So, see comment in standard one and also um, standard 4B was left blank because I didn't know what had been done towards this objective. Uh, Mr. Hainer. Uh, the superintendent provided three pieces of evidence uh, in support of this standard. Uh, the first one was a copy of the Alice rollout. There was no statement as to what was done regarding the standard. Uh, the second one was a listing the administrative team meeting agendas, nothing to support the standard. And the third was uh, a uh, list of organizations and co conferences the superintendent belongs to and participates in, I found that uh, commendable. 
Uh, Mr. Thielman will read for Mr. Pierce. I sense and have observed that at times there is a top-down approach and a lack of resources, ability to communicate to shareholders. That is why market needs improvement in enrollment number 4C. This is improving, however, as seen recently in the over-enrollment meetings and requests for ideas such as forming the PD committee to allow teachers to have some voice in their own professional development offerings. I've seen firsthand her involvement with the superintendent's diversity advisory committee in participating in their meetings and taking in their recommendations by expanding the Today's Students, Tomorrow's Teachers program as but one example. Thank you. Uh, through her interactions with the school committee and the professional staff, I see a superintendent who demonstrates a commitment to high standards of teaching and learning and expects those who work with her to embrace her expectations and strive to meet them. She has worked with the school committee and school leaders to develop goals and strategies that are consistent with the overarching goals of the Arlington Public Schools. The administrative survey indicates that a significant majority of district administrators rate the superintendent as proficient or exemplary on topics covered under the DESE rubric for professional culture. Ms. Starks. Dr. Bodie's strong relationships and open management style have not only helped in managing conflict, but have helped to reduce conflict. Her commitment to high standards and continuous learning for herself fosters those ideals in the district, and I believe that it is important that she lead by example in these areas. I think that the one area that needs more focus in the years to come is shared vision. I would like to see Dr. Bodie communicating not only through the website and newsletters, but also in forums and meetings with parents in the community about education and learning in our district and the state. As the educational leader of her district, I would like to see her play a more integral role in shaping the vision and importance of education in Arlington. Um, next. <laughs> On instruction, I've seen evidence that we take teacher evaluation and professional development seriously. We have high expectations for our teachers, and we support teachers in achieving these expectations. The superintendent has listened to and responded to feedback about prior years' professional development and has worked to improve the value of those programs. The superintendent has created a professional culture that values and respects educators. Internal communication, to my knowledge, works well. However, communication to parents and the larger community can sometimes be awkward. The superintendent could do more to successfully engage stakeholders in the creation of shared educational vision. Um, the non I'm sort of inchoate this way. Two years ago, the school committee asked for a projected model for long-range multi-year planning, but what we saw instead was a projected budget. Uh, and they say, certainly there's some long-range planning details in our technology plan, but I suspect that there are not many people in Arlington who could articulate our educational vision. On our most pressing issue, the strain that our increasing enrollment is placing on our facilities, the superintendent has showed forward thinking by commissioning a dem demographic study and engaging an architect to present some options. While we are still at the beginning of this process, it is our hope that the decisions will be made in an open and transparent manner with input from all stakeholders. Thank you, Mr. Thielman. The superintendent's survey provided useful insights into the professional culture the superintendent is trying to create. Nearly 90% of respondents said the superintendent was proficient or exemplary in enabling instructional staff to create effective and rigorous units of instruction, ensuring high quality content work for all students, and ensuring the principals facilitate practices that cause teachers to modify their teaching when students are not learning, and for allowing time for collaboration to better inform teaching and learning in the district. Thank you. We now turn to page five. Um, this is where it got a little tricky. Uh, the agreement was that we would go for goal one, goal two, goal 3.4, and goal 4.3 as being the focus areas within this. Some members read it beyond. I did not include that in the document, but those um, uh, ratings still exist within the um, uh, the individual members. Uh, Mr. Uh, there is no comment section in this portion of the evaluation. However, Mr. Heener has made extensive comments on the superintendent's performance goals, which are the uh, an appendix, appendix in the back of the uh, document. Uh, Mr. Heener. Uh, I will let the document stand as written and not take the time of the committee at this time. The superintendent will have a copy of this, mm -hmm. and anyone else that seeks it, they have a right to have that. So, yeah, this is this will become a public document as soon as we fix the typos. And, um, and yeah. I just just want to comment that, and I don't know about the rest of the uh, the group. I 
went beyond the ones that we had agreed on based on the evidence giving, given by the superintendent. That's, so I reacted to that. I know there was inconsistency with the group and that, that's the reason why I mentioned that yep. we should pre-populate this next year so that we are all are consistent in how we are rating it uh, and what areas we're rating and what we're looking for. Um, in that the superintendent will have the benefit of looking at the individual evaluations for folks who have gone beyond the uh, the four that we came to consensus on is communication. The value of this process is that it is our one of our ways that we can communicate with the superintendent uh, pertaining to her performance. Goal one, in order to effectively supervise and support principals as well as support high expectations for learning, teacher consistency, and common focus on instruction, I will visit each school a minimum of six times between December 2014 and November 2015 that will include a meeting with the principal and classroom or meeting observations. I am continuing this practice goal from last year because the importance of school visits by the superintendent to support and ensure a consistent focus on district and school goals, maintain visibility in the district, support principals, and understand firsthand the needs in each school. Dr. Allison Ampey rated a significant process, uh, progress. Mr. Hainer rated did not meet. Uh, Mr. Pierce, myself, and Ms. Starks, and Mr. Thielman rated the superintendent as having met the goal. Dr. Seuss did not rate this area for an overall rating of met. Uh, number two, superintendent performance on MCAS 2015 for high need students at all levels at each grade tested will improve from the MCAS baseline in 2014. Dr. Allison Ampey rated significant progress as did Mr. Pierce, myself, uh, Ms. Starks, and Mr. Thielman. Mr. Hainer uh, rated did not meet. Dr. Seuss did not rate it for an overall <laughs> significant progress. 3.4, develop a plan to address space issues related to enrollment growth anticipated over the next three to five years to be presented by the school committee by June 2015. Dr. Allison Ampey rated that as met. Um, Mr. Hainer and Ms. Starks rated that as some progress. Mr. Pierce rated that as significant progress. And myself and Mr. Thielman rated that as exceeded. Uh, quite a range. So th this, this is quite a range. <laughs> Uh, and I think that we all view this a little differently, but uh, I view that as an overall significant progress. And 4.3, the district website will be analyzed and changes implemented to improve the communication of information to parents and the community by June 2015. Uh, Dr. Allison Ampey, Mr. Pierce rated significant progress. Uh, I rated and Ms. Starks rated some progress. Um, Mr. Thielman rated met and Mr. Heiner rated did not meet for an overall of significant progress. Are there any edits, corrections to this portion of the document? Seeing none, we'll move back to page one. We have now left before us uh, the Overall rating uh, summative performance. All members, with the exception of Mr. Heiner, rated the superintendent as proficient. Mr. Heiner has a rating of unsatisfactory. Number four, rate impact on student learning. Uh, Mr. Pierce, myself, and the, Mr. Thielman rated as high. Uh, the remainder of the committee rated as moderate for an overall rating of moderate. Any corrections or changes to that portion. Hearing none, that we get to the final portion of the process is to read the overall comments, and we'll start with Dr. Allison Ampey. I thought this part would be first. Um, for another year, I commend the superintendent on her hard work and dedication to our schools. She goes above and beyond to be present for our community, from attending meetings with parents to school functions to joint school town meetings and more. She shows, her, she shows her caring by her presence. I feel her collaborative approach to working with our teachers and our unions is seen in a couple of accomplishments. Our negotiated contracts that address issues of substance, such as increasing elementary teacher professional development, and in the Rennie Center, choosing Arlington as one of four districts that model early career support for teachers. In my evaluation, I do list a number of areas where I think improvement can be made. 
This is not done out of disrespect, but because I believe our schools deserve the very best possible, and I'm trying to help make this happen. In regards to certain goals, professional practice. It appears that sc some schools did not achieve the desired number of meetings, although evaluations were done. I was unable to assess whether any meetings were announced. Meeting agendas were not detailed, and there was no information about whether better collaboration by evaluators was achieved. Student learning. The state has not yet yet released subgroup MCAS results that would address the goals. There is evidence of strong professional development addressing areas of concern during the school year and over the summer, and it is my hope that this is translated into improved achievement. District improvement, goal 3.4, space and enrollment, was completed and presented to a claim in September. This will enable us to move forward in our handling our expected increased enrollment, although questions remain about which rooms are counted or not for space usage. Goal 4.3, website improvements, appears to be underway, but we haven't seen results yet. Comments for standards are listed separately. Overall assessment. If I, was basing, if I were basing my evaluation solely on evidence provided, I would have given an overall performance rating of needs improvement. I feel the evidence provided was inadequate and sometimes not applicable to the goals. I also felt an opportunity was lost to provide clear-cut information about our schools, information that would have been helpful for advocacy and for educating the community about APS needs and accomplishments. However, I feel a rating of needs improvement would do our school system a disservice. Over the past year in our meetings and all, we have heard of many initiatives and accomplishments. I feel the sum total suggests our school system is moving in the direction we want to see and that a good portion of this movement is due to the superintendent. It is on this that I base my rating of proficient. I also feel the school committee itself, and I'm talking to you guys now, uh, needs to have a serious discussion about evaluations, including how evaluations are conducted, the role of evidence in the evaluations, and an examination of the document used for soliciting feedback. We are trying to manage as a group and to ensure that our superintendent is doing everything to improve our schools. In my opinion, the current evaluation tool does not adequately capture or convey the information needed to facilitate improvement. Thank you. Mr. Hainer. I've decided not to include a comment. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, Mr. Thielman will read for Mr. Pierce. Mr. Pierce says, Dr. Bode, Dr. Bode exhibits strong decision-making in hiring those who will improve student learn learning. So many community members have praised the quality of our teaching staff. MCAS scores show that we are operating with moderate to high growth, student growth. Dr. Bodhi is to be commended with the quality and quantity of professional development offerings, professional learning community, uh, communities for our staff, and curriculum initiatives. Dr. Bodhi deserves credit that our high school students continue to perform well in AP classes and with their SAT scores as much of her leadership with professional development and curriculum has led these students to achieve in high school. Dr. Bode is a proficient veteran superintendent who is respected by her peers, the Arlington community, and the professional staff of the Arlington Public Schools. The superintendent is proficient in the day-to-day -day work of running the school system. She interacts with the school committee in a respectful and collaborative manner. The administrative staff of the district, as indicated by our evaluative survey, view her as a proficient or exemplary leader. The district is facing many critical issues pertaining to our increasing enrollment and the substantial need to improve our facilities. The success of any initiative to rebuild Arlington High School and to provide a sufficient number of classrooms at the elementary and middle school level requires tremendous community outreach. We cannot meet this challenge without a superintendent who has credibility and trust with a diverse group of decision makers, including fiscal leaders in the town government, state officials, and the taxpayers and voters of Arlington. It is essential that our superintendent is able to advance an aggressive building program involving many schools and stakeholders while continuing to run a school system that is focused on excellence in teaching and learning. Dr. Bode has demonstrated her skill and dedication to the children of Arlington, and she will have a lasting positive influence on our district that will endure long beyond, beyond her tenure as superintendent. Ms. Starks. Dr. Bodie continues to lead and foster a district, district where teachers love to teach and students love to learn. The collaborative and open way that she leads allows all voices to be heard and fosters a sense of teamwork, 
where students, teachers, and staff work together to further the learning that goes on in our district. I have seen much growth in the past year in communication out to the community and her work with other arms of the town government. Dr. Seuss. I also thought this would be read first, but uh, for many of these categories, we have insufficient evidence on in which to evaluate the superintendent. For categories where I have no access to evidence, but for which I have not heard of any problems, I have given the superintendent a proficient rating. So that's just sort of explaining my, what I did. Um, the superintendent excels in creating a professional culture that values and respects educators and in data-driven decision-making. The superintendent has focused important attention on the social and emotional needs of our students. There is still work to be done in this area, but that is because it is such a hard problem. The superintendent could do a better job at addressing parental concerns when they emerge and creating a better process for decisions that require school committee oversight. The superintendent is to be commended for engaging a demographer and architect to start the conversation about the strain their increasing enrollment is placing on our facilities. The community has some hard decisions to make. We need to ensure that those decisions are made transparently and honestly. Mr. Thielman. Dr. Bodhi earns a, a rating of exemplary on management and operations because of her efforts towards addressing the district's enrollment growth. She hired McKibben and Associates to do a forecast of enrollment growth, hired HMFH to examine solutions to the displacement of students during the rebuild at Stratton, and submitted a high quality statement of interest which was modified with input from the school committee to the MSBA for the rebuild of Arlington High School. She has been very strategic in analyzing and planning for the district's growth and for involving multiple stakeholders members of the public and members of the boards in the town in this discussion. Thanks to Dr. Bodie's leadership, the school department has done a good job of educating the community on our space challenges, and she has worked forever <coughs> with the town manager to develop a town-wide facilities committee. The way Dr. Bodie has handled the issue of enrollment growth in our facilities needs is a model for other districts. Dr. Bodie's leadership of the design and implementation of a new elementary schedule, the development of an updated technology plan, the improvement of the educator evaluation system, the implementation of the Literacy Lab initiative, the focus of her K-12 math director on improving instruction at all levels, PLCs, the extensive professional development opportunities, the effort to ensure that teachers complete retail training if they require it, the full implementation of Lucy Calkins' writing in all elementary grades, the introduction of connected math at the middle school, the updating of curriculum maps for all disciplines, and the expansion of common assessments at the secondary level are examples of the superintendent's high impact on learning. She did not do this work alone, of course. It is a collaborative effort, but it is an effort led by Superintendent Bodie. In addition, I want to note that Dr. Bodie's proposal to implement the park exam for 2015-16, or 2014-15, had the potential, or no, 2015-16, had the potential to accelerate the district-wide move to the Common Core and had the potential to have a high impact on learning. The student learning goal called for high needs students to improve on MCAS in 2015 over 2014 scores. The data shared showed all high need students improved slightly over 2014 in math in the LA, but there were some dips, fourth grade math, sixth grade math, 10th grade math, sixth grade ELA, seventh grade ELA, and 10th grade ELA. In other areas, communication has been strengthened by the improvements of the district website, the regular monthly newsletter, and all the work the superintendent has done to educate the community about our space needs. I urge the superintendent to complete work on the dashboard, which can create even more transparency and community engagement and the district's work. Okay, I'd like to res uh, hear a motion to approve this document as the 2014-2015 evaluation of Superintendent oh, Bodie, right. moved by Mr. Thielman, seconded by Dr. Seuss. Uh, any discussion on the motion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Uh, the honest vote. Uh, Mr. Hainer. I move in accordance with section two of the existing contract between the Arlington School Committee and the superintendent that a subcommittee be formed to make a recommendation to the full committee no later than the first school committee meeting in December 2015 regarding the continuation of the superintendent's employment. What? Motion on the table. Is there a second? I'll second for discussion. Okay, Mr. Thielman. Okay, uh, Mr. Hainer. I, the, the superintendent's contract, section two, uh, article two, I'm sorry, uh, specifically states that uh, if there is a, any decision by the committee not to continue, they need to, the superintendent needs to be notified no later than December 31st. Mm -hmm. I, we, we skipped this the last time, and it, it became an automatic renewal. It, not that we wouldn't or whatever later in the year. So I just think this needs to be done. I think a, a serious discussion uh, has to be uh, done. I suggested a subcommittee. 
I would also ask the chair to find out if this is an, a basically a, in that it is a contract, can this be done in executive session? I, I think it's a gray area because of everything, the superintendent's position in this state seems to be outside of that. I don't know what happens. Uh, okay, uh, to answer your question, uh, the committee can enter executive uh, session for the purpose of prepare, you know, preparing to negotiate. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, decisions that we make pertaining to this uh, are, is a public right. discussion. Right. Uh, okay. In fact, it's something that the, the community has a right to see us do. So if I just may continue, mm -hmm. this subcommittee would be considered basically a, a negotiating preparing for negotiations, so it would be an executive session, um, based on what you said. Well, the subcommittee would host the meeting, <clears throat> and then if there was a negotiation that was going to take place in the subcommittee, well, if, we would go into executive session. I thought he stated in preparation. Yeah, I, if we are discussing our strategy for negotiations, yeah. uh, we can do that in executive session, and I would propose that we do that just to have a, uh, just to have a subcommittee uh, have the sense of the full committee before entering into negotiations with the superintendent. Then I would recommend putting this maybe for uh, on an agenda item for executive uh, session next next week. Yeah, right. Uh, we can. I will. I will. Okay. I'll, I will draw the motion and just ask the chair to uh, put this as an executive session discussion for next week. Okay, uh, 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 Dr. Seuss. Oh, oh, just to say it does make sense to talk about this all together. So a subcommittee seems like mm -hmm. the wrong sort of approach. I have no problem with that. Mm -hmm. um, Mr. Hainer, do you withdraw your motion? I did. I withdraw okay, the motion has been withdrawn. Any other discussion under this topic? Um, so this will, we'll talk about an executive we session. We will enter, talk about this in executive session next at week. our next meeting. Uh, Ms. Fitzgerald, do you have that? Yes, I do. Thank you very much. Uh, we now, anything else under the, <coughs> Topic of the superintendent evaluation. If none, we go on to the monthly financial reports. Ms. Johnston. Good evening. Um, the elevator uh, required to be drilled out like a bad old cavity down at the bottom. <laughs> and we got the PO out the door same day so we could get the drilling team in, in, in a week earlier, which I'm very proud of. Um, but we're still not fixed yet, so for that little tidbit. Um, not much to report on the financials. The, the main thing that happened between last month and this month is we were able to make finally in Munis all the adjustments for the contract increases. We finally reconciled Munis. When, when we go into Munis, when we start the fiscal year, we upload the approved budget. But as you recall, when we approved the budget last year, we had a line item for contract increases and we didn't show the increases in all the places they actually happened. So now when you go into Munis, you have the original budget, which was approved, and then you have the modified budget that shows the increases in the appropriate places now. So other than that, we're in about the same place. I'm still not projecting any savings at this time because it's too early in the year. I see nothing to suggest that anything drastic is happening, but of course it hasn't started to snow yet. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Seuss. Uh, yeah, I have a couple questions. Um, so one, because I'm still sort of so new to this process, um, the expenses that are being moved, is are those expenses typically moved or is this something? Yes. Okay, so this is like standard procedure. These are the yes. kind of expenses that are moved. Okay, yeah. that's. No, I sent you, I, I answered uh, You told me where they're being moved, but I didn't get like, is this well, a one-off thing? Well, circuit, circuit breaker a... doesn't, it comes in and it sits in its own revolving account. Right. And so at the end of the year, I will move the entire amount of circuit breaker out of the general fund and into circuit breaker. So are we going it, to, right, right, got it. So yeah. at this point in the year, I wouldn't be showing that whole transfer because that would show we have all kinds of money to burn and that, that would give a mistake in impression got it and then one other small question um, so I noticed that salaries and wages are under budget but then the temporaries are above budget is that related well temporary temporary salary and wages tend to run hot because so much of the summer PD goes in mm -hmm. so they don't track in the same kind of right. way they're, they're really front-loaded mm -hmm. but there also is some there's a lot of cleanup work that we need to do in the whole stipends, additional comp area, and stipends fall under that code most of the time. Under temporary, but I, right, okay. I was but just also, wondering. But also what we call green sheets, when somebody does the hourly additional mm -hmm. compensation, that would also appear in there. So professional development, 
money that's paid out for attending professional development would also fall in there. Okay. So what, one of the things that we plan to do for the next fiscal year for FY17 is to really parse out the stipends in a different way so that we can come up with some different coding so we can see different kinds of stipends. Um, you know, right now the only stipends that are really nice and clean the way I'd like them to be are the athletic stipends. Mm -hmm. They're in 81202, which is additional salary other. Right, and they eight, fall under cost center 02, which makes it really simple to find them. 81201 is the one you were talking about previously. That's professional. Right? Yeah, that, and then and that's 81202 the okay. is where the athletic stipends fall, but other things too. Mm -hmm. So we want to clean it up. We want to have okay. it very clear what is athletics, what is teacher leadership, what is special projects, what are student activity stipends. Mm -hmm. We want to really make that much clearer than it has been. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Mr. Hanger. The original uh, cost estimate for the elevator, it was less than 120000 am I correct? Or was it? it wasn't it's 80 for the breakdown of the high school, but there are also contracts in, involved for standard um, testing and fixing of the, okay. of the okay. contract as of, I'm sorry, of the elevators as the year goes on. So all of our elevators are maintained throughout the district, and there's a contract for that. that makes, I keep forgetting that. Uh, line item 84306, carpentry, what are we building? <laughs> We're in the hole for 20000 right now. Well, one of the things we built was a new tech lab at the, um, the middle school this summer. Mm. So that would, part of those expenses would be that. We also built out the office suite uh, no. for the... Um, it was a 20, it, it was a, like a 13000 uh, if I'm reading this right, uh, increase between September and... Uh, November 3rd. So. Yeah, that would, be, that would be when the expenses for the middle school and for the um, student data enrollment, specialist. data specialist, the student enrollment center. That, that was in. all in-house okay. carpentry that was done with supplies to. Mm -hmm. Fine. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Allison Abbey. The elevator, um, isn't that big enough to be a capital expense or, I mean, the repair? It's well, but the way capital years, works, in, the way it work, capital works in Arlington is you have to request it ideally five years in advance, but at least a year in advance, <laughs> and you have to plan for it, and you can't, you can't show up at the capital budget committee and say, hey, this just blew up. That that's generally not how they will do it unless it's a true emergency. I believe our budget can bear this repair. Um, <coughs> it just seems like it should qualify <laughs> as capital. It, it's well, yes, I, the whole high school needs to be gutted. That, that will yeah. certainly yeah. be the, the, the capital expenditure. Yeah. Yep. And had we it, planned for it, I mean, did, were we not going for the whole, the whole enchilada on the high school, mm -hmm. then that's an elevator we should have had in a capital plan for repair. This is where I hope the new facilities department is really going to plug a gap because we've had capital on the one hand, emergency on the other, and that mid-range preventative maintenance has been a weakness. Right. Anyway, it just seems like we're at a disservice because we were trying to hold out and then an emergency happened and so we're having to eat the cost because we were trying to it, it, I I'll just, be sure to make that case when I'm defending my capital <laughs> budget. Thank you. Sure. Hopefully they'll have mercy on some other requests. Is that your elevator speech? Ah. Working on it. <laughs> Any other comments or questions regarding the financial report? Thank you very much. Next is um, class sizes. Dr. Bodie. You received in your um, Novus, um, I guess you call it Novus package, uh, the uh, information on current class sizes, we have reverted back. You see, you see class sizes both in the new template that our, our current registrar has created, but then also we've reverted back so you could actually see what the individual classes are at individual schools. What ha one of the things that happens, even though principals in the summer um, or in June when they're doing class sizes try to make them quite equitable in size, uh, you have students that leave or um, students that leave. And so, that, and so rather than trying to re-equalize the class, they just stay with the, the, the differentials. That's what happens. Um, with respect to why there's some differences at each one of the classes. Um, so one of, the, uh, one of the questions that was asked of me today 
in terms of class sizes, with Ms. Starks asking, um, you know, what has been the history of different classes? And I think this is a, a mm -hmm. discussion that, that she would like to have very much this evening in terms of what is an acceptable class size in which what happens if um, a particular class sometimes will go over where we started in September. That's not uncommon. Um, it, uh, and y you might have a class that started at 24 and before you know it, it's March and it's now up to 26. That's not how we necessarily started. But even, even when we have a class size at 25 at the onset of the school year, uh, what what is our response? What how have how do we uh, manage these cl class sizes? Which some people would feel 25 is certainly too large, and certainly um, there's even disagreement as to whether it's okay at fifth grade versus kindergarten. Well, one of the ways that we have been dealing with this is when our class sizes have gotten over 25 or push 25 at kindergarten, we've gone to a whole day um, teaching assistant. That has not been necessary this year. We do not have any whole day teaching assistants at the kindergarten. We do have some large, large class TAs at other schools and other, at other grades in the district. And you know, one, a good example of that is the Thompson fifth grade. Uh, we, as the numbers, um, at one point in the summer, they were still large, and even this decision of a large class TA was made in the summertime. They, the numbers have creeped up a bit, um, not a lot, but it creeped up enough that they're they're really at a level that had had did, if we had another classroom and we had that classroom in September, we probably would have gone to three sections at mm -hmm. the fifth grade, but that was not an option without at the very last minute. Uh, taking the art classroom out of um, out of use as an art classroom, so I, I it's a it's a very it's a it's a very difficult thing. And in fact, maybe it's a good time to even bring in the buffer zone uh, report. I was going to put it in the superintendent's report, but it really is germane to this issue. With the report that you have on this, I think that you can see that. From grades one to five, the buffer zones make a very, some difference. And when you look at average class sizes, there's usually a, a decimal point difference. What that means is that it's probably one or two students at that grade um, that have been moved to another school just to even things off. I think where you see the, the most effect is at the kindergarten level. And you can compare what the, what the class sizes would have been mm -hmm without the buffer zones compared to what they are uh, with the buffer zones. And again, it's a little bit, it's not significant. I, I, you know, I, I hesitate to even say this, but honestly, in, in terms of being able to really do this at a much more macro level, we would have to have very large uh, buffer zones or perhaps even have just, as they do in Cambridge, you, get a, you basically get assigned uh, you get your preference, but you get assigned to a school based on um, the class sizes. So it's, it's something that we should all discuss for sure um, and um, in terms of what, <coughs> how we want to move forward with this and what, what, uh, what um, I, I have an internal number in terms of when we go to cl uh, large class sizes, um, large class TAs. Um, but I think that this is definitely a discussion for the committee to take on. It certainly has a strong relationship to the number of classrooms that we need in the district. Um, but on the other hand, if you, as a, an example I responded um, <coughs> to this afternoon about is if you, if you Take, for example, a, class that's a couple of, of the classes that are 25, 25, 24, and you decide that you want to make that into four classrooms. Well, one, you have to have the space, but two, you have to look at, at the district level in terms of whether that's equitable to what's happening to all the other schools. So it's not just a single focus on a particular number. It's really looking at these numbers in relationship to a whole district. 
Thank you. I just want to make one comment here mm -hmm. before we go on. I mean, you're referencing uh, uh, email, and, and I want to point out the fact that uh, Ms. Stark sent an email to the superintendent requesting information, which mm -hmm. is certainly something that school committee members can and should do, and the superintendent responded to that in terms of providing information. Uh, exchanges between members and the superintendent in that nature seeking invitation are never deliberative in nature. No, there's information. They are informational. Mm -hmm. It becomes correspondence and the superintendent appropriately shares the information she sends to one member to the entire committee. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the committee then restrains itself from commenting on it because if any other member of the committee subsequent to that email back from the superintendent engages in a discussion it becomes a deliberation which would be a violation of the open meeting law and uh, mm -hmm. the, the committee is knowledgeable of the open meeting law and does not do that uh, on a regular basis uh, sometimes we make a mistake and we try to acknowledge that but uh, uh, the exchange between Ms. Starks and the superintendent, which was cc'd to the rest of the committee, is considered as correspondence and will be available as such um, as a matter of business. So I just wanted to lay that out because there, there exactly was a right. question it's of whether a, or not this was uh, uh, deliberative or uh, informational. No, it was definitely informational and in giving information back and providing some other additional information tonight. I think it's a really important um, topic to, to talk about, mm -hmm. and um, particularly in light of the discussion that we're going to be having over the next couple of months mm -hmm. about space. Mr. Hainer. In light of what you just said, if something magic could be found, and I'm not suggesting anything at this time, in the fifth grades were removed from all the elementary schools. Mm -hmm. Would that solve problems going forward at the elementary. It's a hypothetical. That's all it is. You mean space-wise? Space-wise. For the potential growth that we're looking at. Well, I'd have to qualify that answer, uh, really, because... I'm sorry for putting you on the spot. Yeah, it's... it's it, it, I don't think there's a quick answer to that. Okay. Perfectly honest. Okay, thank uh, you. Okay, I know that the, the issue of class sizes is, a, is always a significant concern of the committee. Uh, the folks from the down first grade are just part of our constituency that we mm -hmm. certainly care about and we're alert for that. And uh, that's sort of the reason why this topic pops up on the agenda with, with, with tremendous frequency. Uh, it's not easy. We don't have the space. We, you know, there, there are a lot of challenges before us. Uh, and, and I just hope that the public knows that we're doing it the best we can to work with the superintendent in order to appropriate uh, the, the proper resources, to budget the appropriate resources and to give her the tools she needs to go and provide the best possible education on her elementary level where this can be an issue. Uh, Ms. Starks. Um, so after looking at all of these, um, I had a, a couple of concerns. Um, my first concern is that while the McKibben report also pointed to Thompson and Hardy, and those obviously stand out because not only do we have, um, for example, the Thompson two fifth grade, we only have two fifth grades that will exit, and we have four kindergartners plus four kindergarten classes plus incoming, so we and no class space. So that's an obvious one. Um, Dallin, we have a similar issue um, because we have four fifth grades leaving. We have four kindergartens, but we actually have four and a half kindergartens with three no... Um, three and a half. Three and a half. Three and a half. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, we have an extra. We get an extra. Right, class right, class. right. But we, we have to break that up as they move forward. So, um, and there's no extra classes there. So. Dallin, I feel like, is also kind of on the brink. I'm also quite concerned about Bishop. Bishop's class sizes in every grade are bigger than anybody else, um, particularly the fourth grade. Um, and I notice here that they do have one, what it will call, I'm not gonna call it an extra classroom, maybe an available classroom. Um, 
but I feel like that should be used almost immediately to fix the fourth grade problem. I mean, a class of 27, 26, I mean, the Thompson ones, I know we don't have any space to do anything about. Um, and I, I, I am apologetic for how huge those classes are. I cannot imagine 30 students in a classroom. I have a class of 23 this year that I feel like is unruly and they're sixth graders. Um, so in my mind, we actually have four schools next year that are in what I call crisis. Two at level like, oh my gosh, the bells have to be going off, and two where the bells are gonna go off right after those two are fixed. Mm -hmm. um, and I know, I, I'm not, I don't want any of this, is, none of this is meant as criticism. I know that we are doing what we can with what we have. Um, I'm, not, I'm not saying anything like that. I just, I really feel like the, the problem lies in the fact that we have for too long thought of um, keeping uh, level service, meaning that it's the level of staff that we have, instead of meaning level service, meaning every student is gonna be in an equitable class size, and we're, that we're gonna keep the student load even. Um, because, and so what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to come up with a formula where we can define what student load is for a teacher. Um, and it has to take into account the number of students, the age of the students, the number of subjects that a teacher has to teach, the number of students you have with special needs, as well as other duties that those teachers have to do. Um, depending on the school, they may also have to do other things. Um, and what I would really like to see us do is come up with some formula and agree that we have whatever that formula is and then agree what we will do if a, a class has to go over that. Because we know because of funding that sometimes that happens. That's not necessarily in our control. But that we will do what we can to mitigate what those circumstances are. Um, but I feel like, like I've, and, and I feel like it's all of us, you know, I feel like we need to start pushing back and say to the town, you know what, we can't just keep shoving more students into the same classrooms. It's not working and it's really gonna start breaking. Um, and, you know, we have, you know, over, if, if, I, if my count is correct, three, six, nine, ten, we have ten classes of 25 or greater, um, I would hope that every single one of those has some kind of an aide or an extra person in them. Um, I also believe that in kindergarten there should be no more than 20 in a classroom. So almost all of our classrooms, except at Dallin, um, are, are, every school has at least one or two of those uh, that exceed that. Um, even though I know that they do have part-time aid. So I don't know, this is something that I'm just, I'm, I, I mean, I'm really concerned about class sizes. I feel like when you think about, I was trying to think about why is this so worrisome to me? And I think that because mm -hmm. if you think about the top five things that we have to have for great education, although the first one is great teachers, the second one is student load. Um, and we can have fabulous teachers, but if we give them too many students or if the student load that they have is too great, there's almost nothing they can do. Mm -hmm. um, you, it really, I mean, like I said, I'm feeling it myself in my own school. Um, we are also going through a growth in Lexington and um, I just feel like we really need to start thinking about what we are gonna find acceptable and I'm getting a lot, a lot, a lot of parents who are telling me mm -hmm. that these class sizes are unacceptable, mm -hmm. not just Dallin, everywhere. Um, and uh, so I, I know that it's not our fault. We're doing what we can with the, with the funding and the, and the you mm -hmm. know, facilities that we have. But I really want us to be open to listening to all of them and um, like trying to come up with something. And we are going to have to go back to the town um, and say, you know, this is, this is unacceptable, not just from us. Um, although it is, should be unacceptable to us, but also to our parents and, and the community. So uh, I really want to thank you for all this information. It's really kind of gotten my head around where I feel like 
I want to take this, and that, that's really exciting to me because I have something to kind of hang my hat on and work on. So uh, thank you very much, and, and uh, I really hope that we can mitigate some of this as we move ahead. But I do want to know then, I know that we have said, and, and you know, as this uh, group gets together for starting to deal with some of these enrollment issues, I know that we've said that next year we have to do something at Thompson, but to me we have to do something at Thompson, Hardy, Dallin, and Bishop. Um, and, and that, <laughs> I'm like, now what? You know, I know it doesn't help, but I feel like the problem is actually much bigger. Mr. Hainer. Uh, I agree with you 100%. I think the idea of coming up with a formula is gonna be difficult, but when it's done, it rings a bell. Can we solve, we, we're aware of it, we're communicating that we're aware of it, and uh, hopefully we can do something about it. Uh, going forward with the, the, the new committee to, for space and stuff, and, that nature. We have to look at the, the whole thing. Um, and I appreciate also your mentioning, I, I was afraid I was gonna have to do it one more time and the committee's gonna hit me on the head, that we have to look at the type of student in the room as well. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they can, it's the time that it takes the teacher to work. Where some, cl your class of 23, if they were all self-motivated and go for it, you could probably get it up to 26 and no problem. And 18 that aren't, or like me, if you had 18 like me, you'd be in trouble. <laughs> so, thank you. Mr. Thielman. I agree with that last comment. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> my question is, uh, you know, we've been talking about this commission, this space committee, this town-wide committee on space. Where, where, where are we at on that? The Board of Selectmen um, need to approve the two representatives, and I-, I They have. They have. They, they have they they Ms. Yeah. Mahan and uh, Mr. Kuro. Yeah. yeah, okay. So then I, then there was, couple of other members. Um, I, my understanding is that the town manager would like this committee to meet probably in the next week or two. So a doodle is going to be going out um, very soon to the people on the committee. It'll be a very open, people can come uh, it, under, there'll be an opportunity for public participation on these committees. Um, I think that one of the first things that we'll have to do is to, to see what the timeline is in decisions that need to be made this year. And that will be will involve uh, quite a bit of discussion. Thank you. Any, um, Dr. Seuss. Uh, yeah, I have a couple things. So I'm going to the Bishop PTO next week. So I was looking at the Bishop numbers very closely, and um, I realized what I'm anticipating to be their frustration. I haven't talked to them yet. Um, that they are not a school that's being mentioned as having a big problem. But if you look at it, they basically they don't get better, right? So, so for the next 10 years, they're in the exact same situation mm -hmm. they're in with fairly large classes. Um, and so I, I understand that frustration. Um, I do think that at some point as a community, we, want, want, we need to talk about larger buffer zones potentially. Mm -hmm. um, that's not an immediate solution, but that just might need to be part of the solution in the mm -hmm. long run. You mm -hmm. can refer that topic to the Community Relations Committee at any time. <laughs> the buffer zones? <laughs> so to this year, I think we have a lot on our plate, and, we, and as a community, we have a lot on our plate, but I'm saying mm -hmm. in the future, I think we need to do that. Um, one of the things I emphasize to parents whenever I talk to them who express their concerns, um, when they talk about equity, is that to achieve perfect equity, you'd have to move five students here, five students. We just, that is, we can't do that. The tools of our disposal are very crude. We can add a classroom, we can take away a classroom, we can add an aid, um, but there's no, given the tools that we have without, say, this universal buffer zone, um, there's no way that we can achieve perfect equity. We just can't, mm -hmm. it's just, right. yeah. well, and, and we, we can get move, better. We don't move kids. From grade to grade. Right, and we don't say you're fourth grader. You're, you're in, you know, you're yeah, not right, exactly. So it's not like. So it's, it's just, it's, it's basically impossible to achieve perfect equity, even if we had other right. tools. Yeah, exactly. Right. So, and, and that's because, like they said, people move in. No control over that. Yeah, actually, you know, you, just, just when you think you've board. got it, you know. Okay, here's a chair thing one at a time. So actually, I have one question about something else that's presented. Okay. Are we talking about that later or? I have a question. Actually. Go ahead, ask okay. the question. So the question, um, I. Thank you very much for getting us um, this sort of overview of our space, what's available in the district and what's needed. That was really helpful and great. And I just have a question. Um, how many schools still have computer labs? I mean, so Bishop has one. Uh, Hardy, I think, might, but they're going to lose them. Is that right? Or Pierce. Pierce. Pierce does? Okay. And Is so Bishop and Pierce used? at this point? Yeah. And that's it. 
And Hardy does still, or? It, it does, but will but, not. But next year, they definitely won't. They won't have it. Yeah, right, okay. All right, that's just, just curious about that. Thanks. Can I, can I make a comment uh, on that? Please. The number, the, I think the chart is, is helpful in thinking about because when we had our architectural firm look at space, the thing that um, they were, that Ms. Coles was doing was looking at it from the eyes of an architect. So if she saw a bank of um, small offices in a corner, as an architect, she's looking at, well, we can knock those walls down, and that would be another, that's a specialist space that could become a classroom. Mm -hmm. The, the only issue is, is that where do those specialists mm -hmm. go? Right. Because we have ELL responsibility, learning center, um, we have reading programs, we have, um, there, there's OT, there's PT. So you can solve it architecturally, but don't solve, mm -hmm. you create another problem. Mm -hmm. So the chart that I gave you looks at it from a different point of view. It is just simply, leave those small offices alone mm -hmm. and what are really the available classrooms that we have and what will be the case next year. And I've gone over all of the data in there with the principals that every single person has approved what has been given to you. Oh, Dr. Allison Ampey. Um, I'll start with this also. So I appreciate the list of the extra classrooms, but I still would like to have the additional information from the space study, just how is she, when, when you look at the floor plans of the different schools, you can see little spaces here and there, and just how all of those were counted. You know, this, this room is too small um, for anything. You know, there's a lot of spaces that, that people were bringing up even at the um, forum and we don't have anything to tell us what's in the room. And I was hoping this was going to be part of it, and I understand the usefulness of this as you're discussing for next year, but I'm saying we're still missing this chunk from the space study of what are all the spaces in the schools and the ones that aren't used, you know, why are, why are the ones that are deemed not usable not usable? You know, they're too small or, or what? Well, they're, it, they're all being used. They're all being used. I mean used being by... used as a classroom. Oh. It, mm -hmm. There was a lot of spaces. You know, there's things that are kind of close to the border, or, and it's just it would be helpful to have the list of how all the different rooms are classified. Would it be easier to, to have a floor plan and have it marked? This is for ELL, this is for SLP, this is for OT. It, it's, I don't want to talk about so much about what they're being used for, but whether or not they can be used as a classroom space. I understand that there's the other needs that will happen and that those come in too, but part of the questions that were being, I mean, part of the big question for the space study was how many classrooms do we have in our district? And there was a lot of rooms that fell into a gray area that were ostensibly not usable, but it wasn't explained why. And I just think we should somewhere capture that on paper so we can communicate because we were getting questions. You know, pe other people are looking at the plans and saying, well, why can't we put something here? And I'm saying we just need somewhere to say, we can't put something there because it's below the, f you know, it, it's in this square, square footage category or because on the plans you can't tell, some of the rooms look pretty close to big enough. You're, you're still not looking like you understand. Yeah, I, well, I, I think that this probably, we, you'd have to sit and show me what you're talking about. I have, uh, in the McKibben report, and the Space Day report, all of the, all of the floor plans are there. The floor and plans are there, but the- What it helped is, that, is, is Dr. Sessman saying, actually say, this is OT, this is PT, because those have to be somewhere. Maybe, Do you want them also I, marked too small or too yeah, small? Yeah, something. So take yeah. the floor plan. Yeah. I, I think that would give you all the information you need. It right. was to tell you what's in it and then why it yes. can't be a classroom. So TS yes. for too small. Yes. So SLP, yes. TS. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. It, it's I think it's uh, potentially. square feet well, or something. It's less than we Yeah, we could do that. But 
as I said, uh, Ms. Coles was looking at, well, what about if we, we took a bunch of those little rooms and knocked the walls down? R and, and, and that could be a classroom, because the classrooms usually should go between 850 to 950 square feet. That's, that's the range mm -hmm. that you would look at. Yes, you could knock down walls, but the problem is, fine, you could create a classroom, but then where do all those services go because there's not another space to put them in? I, I understand that it okay. can just push the problem, you know, change the problem that you're change trying the to problem. have, but part of it was just, it's helpful to be able to tell people why we're doing some things and some of the stuff we didn't have the information about why, why we couldn't use this as a classroom. You know, it might be helpful if maybe we could be more specific. We could do this at a subcommittee meeting to see exact, we could go through the floor plans and show me exactly what, what there you would like more explanation about. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so that was one thing. Um, the second thing was the buffer zone um, information. I would still like to, I understand that we got the information about what the class sizes would be, but I think we need to be doing an actual analysis, at least comparing what the class sizes would have been with the buffer zone and what they would have been without the buffer zone and looking at those two numbers on the same sheet of paper. You, and I threw something together, but I don't know if I used the right comparison. Well. We didn't do it by individual classes because there's no way to project what the class would be. But you have a two, you have one, you have two charts. Mm -hmm. I know, but I'm having to go back and forth between the two charts, and it's very hard to see. And when I when I pulled it up myself, it actually it doesn't look like the buffer zones are doing that much. And that's we should be able to see this, and we should. It should be on the same piece of paper. You want one them column. overlap the charts? Is that what you want? I want on the same piece of paper. Same piece you of paper. You have bishop, and then without buffer zones, this is what the class sizes would have been. And, and I mean, the, you can do the, the overall groupings like you did. You know, the, this is the cohort size, and this is how many classes, and so this is the average. And then with the buffer zones, this is what we ended up with. And then this is what we did for bracket, two columns. And we should be able to see if we're seeing differences or not. And um, part of it is I'm not sure which, which month's enrollment data we should be using to look at. So that's why I'm not positive the numbers I'm looking at are correct. But, but we should be reporting this out. Well. On the, uh, if we were, are you talking about using this particular chart and putting what the class sizes would be on next, next yeah, to them? I'm sorry, I can't tell which one this that is. is. That's uh, the traditional no, class by class. No, no, I'm saying no, you, you just mean the, the class noise. averages. You just want you just want these two documents to be put on the same mm -hmm. page. On the same page, column by column, column so by column. that we okay, can see this is yeah. you know this or that, this or that on on all of them. Well, you're. Uh, that easy, that's easy to be done, um, and we can do that for you. <coughs> as, as I said in my opening remarks about this, there isn't much that would be showing up here on averages. There are decimal differences. You, you might have a, you know, like a 25.3 or a, and then a 25.7 or something like that. It's a decimal difference at the grades one through five. So that indicates there's one or two kids be, that would have been, been move between two schools. Where you can see the difference the most is at the kindergarten. And again, it's not a lot. We have only, and actually it corresponds to the percentage, roughly speaking, of the buffer zone area. 23% of the town land area, residential area, is in buffer zones. And roughly speaking, that's almost about the number of students that are, we, we look at placing. So you're going to see the most difference in kindergarten because there's a little bit more um, work that's done at that level. Once students move into town, you already have a cl established class sizes and it's really just moderate 
changes that can happen. Right. I, I, yeah. I understand all that. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying that we should be looking at what we got and whether we think it's worth the hassle that we're putting everyone through for. And, and I'm looking at the kindergarten sizes, and yes, they're somewhat different, but there's, out, you know, there's outliers there too, and, and it, I just think we should be all looking at these numbers. And we need to have them all in front of us, the same data, so that we're all looking at the same page. Another comment? The, the one thing that strikes me when I look at the, uh, the, ch the class sizes, um, the chart that has been sort of been the traditional one we've used, is you look across a grade level across the district and there's so much variation. And so it, it, we, we were in the situation of going to buffer zones because of our, our work with Thompson. This was a condition of the larger school that the MSBA would, would contribute to. Um, and it has moderate, a very minimal, it has minimal impact. But on the other hand, when you've got, take the fifth grade, you've got you know, 29, 30 at Thompson, but at Pierce you have 19 and 20. How can you take a town and move, the, move everything, move students so that that doesn't happen. You could create equitability here and not large class sizes at almost every grade. Um, virtually at almost every grade you could create more equitability if, there w if that was the first priority. But if the first priority remains in town to have neighborhood schools, it's not necessarily solvable that in, inequity is going to remain and it's, the buffer zones is only going to minimally change things. It's inherent in having seven small schools. Um, I, I just want to thank uh, Ms. Starks and Mr. Heiner for bringing the topic up and asking for this to be on the agenda tonight. I think it's just the whole topic of uh, class size and enrollment is critical. And, just my sense, and I don't have the data to back it up, but my sense is that, <coughs> excuse me, class size has been creeping up a little each year. Yes. Uh, sort of like, you know, the frog in the uh, bucket of water that you put on the stove, it doesn't realize that's, it's... That's, that's pretty yeah. false, actually. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's been debunked. Well, I don't know why it's been debunked. It's a nice metaphor, and I think people understand it. Uh, I think most self-respecting frogs would probably hop out and feel the pain. Uh, uh, but that said, uh, are we ready to go on? Yes. Here we go. We're going to superintendent's report. Um, first of all, um, I, I can't begin the report without making a comment on the, the, the evaluation. Uh, I want to I wanna thank all of you. I, it's very clear that you spent a lot of time thinking about this and looking at evidence in the, um, in the, we have this electronic file. But one of the things that did strike me too is there's a lot of, a lot of discussion around evidence and when the committee that was formed for the evaluation, <coughs> when we talked about this, my understanding was that we would be looking at the standards and not the individual indicators, and that we would have that I would provide three pieces of evidence for each standard, not necessarily a piece of evidence or several pieces of evidence for every indicator, which is what we don't do that with our teachers and administrators. They do three pieces of evidence per standard. Um, so in some cases, you had a lot, and uh, I, I, underst I understand your comment about wanting to have a little bit more maybe explanation of it. And I think that's actually going to be one of the positives that will come out of this going back to curriculum and instruction because um, we can get some shared understanding of how many, what are you looking for, how, how you want the evidence to be presented, which as uh, Mr. Schlickman was saying, this is a, I don't know, is a rigid boot you were talking about? Mm -hmm. That this is something we're growing with and trying yeah. to figure out how to do. And we're doing the same thing, mm -hmm. you know, with teachers and administrators. We're all uh, growing with this. Um, 
but all in all, I think it's a, there's more positives in the process than not. So I appreciate the, the time you spent on that, and I think people should know in the community that you spend a lot of time, and you take your jobs very seriously, and I think that that's, um, uh, that's important, and it's a, it's a compliment to all of you that, that you do. So thank you for taking the time to do it, and so we'll move forward, and I think there were some good suggestions that came tonight, and you know, we're all growing. It's all, it, it's all about how you do what we, you do better. And, um, and it's helpful to get some constructive comments on that. So I appreciate, appreciate your efforts. So I have a, 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 a few things. Um, one of the, the big news off the, that came out today in a press release, which I forwarded as fast as I could to everybody in the district as well as to, the, to, to all of you, is the uh, press release today from the commissioner um, regarding his recommendation going forward on assessments. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion, as you're aware, that the, um, there are people that, that want to make sure that the high standards in Massachusetts remain high standards and that our assessments reflect that and want to have more control over what those assessments are going, going to be. So what he, what he has suggested, and, and it actually came out at a meeting that Dr. Chesson and I were at two weeks ago, is having a, um, a Massachusetts park-like assessment. He calls it MCAS 2.0. It's, um, he wishes he called it the new generation, the, mm -hmm. the next generational MCAS. But the, the fact is that he is looking at a way that we're gonna move forward with this, feeling, making the point that the current MCAS is really at a point where it's time to move on, that mm -hmm. um, we can have a much better assessment in terms of critical thinking skills if we move to a, a, an assessment which is more rigorous and more aligned with the, um, the Common Core. Mm -hmm. So his recommendation, as I said, is to have this uh, next generation assessment. Um, that the state would eventually commit to computer-based state assessments with the goal of implementing this statewide by the spring of 2019. And that Massachusetts would stay part of the, the park um, consortium in order to have high quality assessment development while sharing the costs of this development. Um, and it might be able to use some of the park databases on this if you were, if the state was going to do this from scratch, mm -hmm. probably it would take three years, and, mm -hmm. and that was the case. And then there would be revisions as we go along. So by sort of having the Massachusetts part of it and also being able to use what have been very well researched questions. I haven't seen the, qu I've only seen samples of the questions on parks, which everybody can see on the um, DESE website. Um, the other part of this is what is going to happen this coming spring, and the, uh, he, he is saying that people who, districts that have done MCAS this year can continue doing MCAS, districts that have done PARC can do PARC, but he's, he's also putting a carrot out to districts that um, want, to, want to try a PARC exam this year that they would help be held harmless in terms of accountability. Of course, we haven't seen our accountability ratings right now, but at any rate, we would held, held harmless. The thing about this proposal is, is that the following spring, spring 17, mm -hmm. we would be moving into the Massachusetts Park-like assessment. Mm -hmm. So one of the issues we have, and we're gonna, and we're gonna next week present where we are in our recommendation to you is to think about what we're gonna do this coming spring, and we need as much lead time as possible to, to move forward if we're going to go with uh, the park. Did I understand that? I think you just um, talked. I'm Mr. sorry, I apologize. Mr. Hainer. Thank you, I'm sorry. That if we, if we chose, and I'm not saying we're going there, to go park, we'd be held, we wouldn't be held accountable? Correct, there'd be no harm. So, 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 Okay, Mr. Hainer, no, I, I uh, let, let, me, let me just say that the, the process would be to hold harmless the scores for a district that moves to park. I understand. So that if our scores go up, they go up, our, our canopy level. 
would not go down. Okay. But my concern is those school systems, as we were this year, we stayed with MCAS. The, the pool got smaller because there were those that were in there. We're held accountable. And if more do this, and for whatever, I'm not saying we're going there, but if we stayed with the MCAS 100%, the pool even gets that much smaller. There's a suit out there to be happened. I mean, you're hurt if you stay with MCAS. You're punished if you, I mean, you're given a, a freebie for a whole year or two years, which I, I well, find- one year. One year. Well, the, the, those that will go on it for a second year, which is probably no. not- uh, the, the, the year after you move to park, so the ones that move to park this year would okay. not be held harmless next okay. year. That, that's philosophy. Mm -hmm. Is there anything in this discussion for the, the seniors uh, coming forward that are still going to have to pass an MCAS no matter whether you've gone to park last year? That's uh, the no, the okay. answer is no, the park is not in a high no, school test. But no, they've yeah. addressed it, she said. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. right. I scanned mm -hmm. it today. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm concerned about those that have to stay with it for X amount of years. 2019 is the first time that they would consider it being a, a, graduation. a graduation requirement. Thank you. But this year they have to take the MCAS. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, Ms. Starks. Um, the one thing that had me actually most concerned was um, number four on this uh, list of <laughs> things of his recommendations, which is that um, as an adjunct to the test development process, we will convene review panels comprised of Massachusetts K-12 teachers and higher education facility to review the current ELA and math curriculum frameworks and identify any modifications or additions to ensure the Commonwealth standards, blah, 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 blah. And I am just like, really? We just Did it. moved to Common Core. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we are going to look at our curriculum again. I, I don't believe, well, it's just no. my opinion, but I don't believe that there would be very many changes because we're already aligned, well aligned, so unlike some other states. But I'm sure that they're just taking there is There is a political component to that just, yeah. that in that there are folks who think that the Common Core is not as good as Massachusetts, so you're going to make that statement uh, where they're, they're pretty they're pretty equivalent. I mean, there's some higher end stuff in the uh, Common Core, but you, you're not losing anything by going to Common Core. In fact, no, I know I like the Common Core. I'm fine. Too. I've bought into it. I'm just really tired. I feel like every mm -hmm. two years we have a new curriculum, and I feel like that's one of the things that they really don't see. Mm -hmm. It costs us money every yes, time they really change the curriculum out from the public under education. Us, mm -hmm. You know, and it's I just want to make sure that I mean I don't know who we get to give feedback to on this wonderful 18-page document, but I really, you know, I, I was believe like, that there's a there's a uh, public forum right next week. Yeah, and there's a public forum. What was it? We're in the western Monday? part, we're yeah. western part it's of the real. state. Pittsfield. Yeah, Pittsfield. Pittsfield, yeah. yeah. Well, we can't get there. Can't get there. Take a bus. Yeah. Could be worse. It could be North Adams. Um, uh, how much worse is that? There, no, let's see. The, the uh, it, There is one next uh, on, the, on the 16th from 4 to 7 p.m. at Malden High School. And that will be its sixth and final public comment session on the uh, Massachusetts Next Statewide Assessment System. So uh, we have a community relations meeting. Okay, uh, anything else under superintendent's report? Yes. <laughs> I have a few more. Um, I'm actually, this, I'm really pleased to announce um, three different awards um, for our athletes and our AD. Um, let me, uh, well, just just very recently, and the pictures and the, will be the ex they'll be in the newsletter, which by the way is going to come out any day now. The um, MIAA Educational Athletics Award in Leadership was presented uh, by the MIAA to our Captain's Council work in leadership. The MIAA grants these as they see fit to teams or individuals who demonstrate excellence in an area of one of their five pillars of educational athletics. While there isn't a limit or timeline specific to these awards, the recipients have to meet their standards of excellence. They said we are unique in that we're the only Captain's Council to receive this award. And much credit goes to our athletic director, uh, Melissa Dugalecki, for initiating this. And um, so I was there when they actually presented the award. Um, 
Similarly, the, there's a, a special award um, that is given at the district level, and it's similar to the sportsmanship award, which I will talk about in a second. There is one recipient for this award in each district each year. The criteria is exactly um, as stated that this award is presented annually to an athletic administrator with three to five years experience who has exemplified the highest standards of the profession and has made significant contributions to their school, league, district, and state. The reward is presented at the annual conference in March and there are eight recipients and our athletic director is one of those eight. There are eight regions in Massachusetts and there's one from each region. So it's, a, it's quite a, um, an honor and I want to congratulate Mr. Galecti for this honor. And lastly, it's the District B, the, the district we belong to, it's the Sportsmanship Award. We, as a member of the Middlesex League, uh, District B, um, in our district, there are around 42 schools in it. Um, of all the schools in our district, Arlington High School was chosen for the District B Sportsmanship Award. There are eight of these total given to eight high schools every year. And again, uh, this is an award given to, um, it will be given at the Sportsmanship, Sportsmanship Summit at Gillette Stadium on November 20th. So Excellent. congratulations to our ath athletes. Mm -hmm. And I have to say, they, they demonstrate that in many ways. Um, we, unfortunately, we had three teams go to the playoffs this year, and a, a very disappointing end to the boys, the, the boys and the girls soccer. Um, they, they played marvelously. They went into two overtimes, 10 minutes each, and then in the shootout, uh, both teams lost 3-2 but they were gracious, and uh, it's no wonder they received this award. So congratulations to all our athletes. It's a, it's a joint, it's a, it's a joint effort that, that, um, that they, that's got them there. Um, this is a, just a little plug for the Arlington Center for the Arts. Um, they are having an event on Sunday the 15th, which is this Sunday from one to four. It's, um, is, it's Arlington is breaking new grounds using the arts. It's the True Story Theater has been awarded a grant from the National Endowment for Arts to support, um, to support this effort. So a benefit performance of this and the silent auction will introduce this project and it's this Sunday from, from one to four at the Arlington Center for the Arts. Let me just make sure I have something else. Um, I wanted to mention that the flagpole at the high school is up, and a, a one, one of our um, former parents, Mrs. Preston, has actually donated a new flag for the, the pole, and I want to thank her publicly for that. And lastly, but very important nonetheless, I'm sorry it's last, is that um, Tuesday night I, I went before the Park and Recreation Board to have their formal approval for the Stratton, uh, being able to use some of the, the field for the Stratton mobile um, configuration. Because it's not really quite clear where the line demarcation is, but it's clear from the, in, the encroachment into the, the field part of it that we probably have crossed the line. And they were very supportive of this. The, the, the one thing they ask is that the field um, be return to the state that it was after the construction, which is something we had planned to do anyway. One of the things I did learn, which I, I didn't know until this week, is that we do have an irrigation system up there in, in the Stratton field. And um, so there's gonna be some thought on their part as to, it's zoned as to whether some zones will remain active, another zone may not, but that's something that they're working on. We do want the field to remain in good shape during the year and, and, and watering will be an important part of that. So anyway, I want to thank the Parks and Rec for their support and um, we are moving forward with the plans. We, I think we're probably about six weeks out from actually issuing RFPs uh, for the modular and we've been working um, 
There are parent groups, a parent teacher group, and they've been wonderful in terms of giving suggestions uh, to, to me. And I've actually been meeting with a, a teacher and one of the parents from that group. And they have become part of another um, group that is meeting with DRA on a regular basis to get, actually put these RFPs out in terms of troubleshooting a lot of the details that need to be thought through um, before we actually go out. Because you don't want to surprise. You don't, you, we, well, you have to make sure you've covered all the details. And, and some things such as simple as where are the partitions going to be in the modulars where we're going to have OT and Learning Center and all that. The other thing is we're going to be doing a, a, a remake of the cafeteria so that we can have multiple uses there. One, one probably would be that the stage will become a, a teacher workroom, teacher center, because when we have Specials be now being conducted in classrooms to the extent that they might have to be. Teachers need a place to go and, and work. Um, we also to fig we're also figuring out how to create the library, um, how we might be able to have some art classes in the cafeteria. So that room is going to become multi-purposed and it needs considerable planning. So we're, there's a, a myriad of details along this line that we're trying to work out right now before we go out to uh, to bid. Mr. Hainer. Heidi Playground. Uh, can I defer, defer this time. to Ms. Johnson? Um, the contracts went out on October 16th. I've spoken to the contractor. The parts were ordered on October 5th, and it's a 8 to 12 week turnaround. Once they have the parts in hand, then about a week, hopefully, we're trying to set up a meeting when Mark Miano gets back next week from his vacation to get a pre-construction meeting, but we don't really want to, we really don't want to get that going until we're, you know, a couple of weeks away from construction. So they don't have the parts yet, and once they get the parts, then we'll get the work done. They think they can get the job done very quickly once the parts are in hand. Why was there a, th excuse me, yeah. uh -huh. why was there a three-week delay between award and getting it signed? I thought you said the award was on the 15th of September. No. And no, the, the contract, the, the documents came in at the end of August and we were doing our due diligence and then there was getting the contracts out the door. I don't normally do contracts like this. Normally it's handled by the town, but because the, ta because the school department is paying for this, I had to handle it and it did take a little longer to get them out. We wanted okay. to be sure we did them right. So the contract was awarded in the middle of September, right? September no, the, the formal contracts went out. We, 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 we picked a winner, but we wanted to do some diligence around to make sure that they were qualified. But it took a, it took a couple weeks to get the contracts out the door. I'm, I'm sorry. I thought you said you were award the contract was awarded in the middle of September. We, we designated a low bidder, but still had to do some further research to make sure there wasn't a reason to bar the low bidder. So it wasn't finalized till the October 6th? They got the final contracts on October 16th. But 16th, based, okay. Yeah, but based on, the, um, based on our communication with them, they ordered the parts on October 5th. So they actually, with good faith, ordered the parts ahead of actually having the contract in hand. Thank you. Anyone else? That's it. Okay, now we come to the beloved consent agenda. All items listed with an asterisk are considered to be routine and will be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless a member of the committee so requests, in which event the item will be considered in its normal sequence. Approval of warrant number 16059, dated October 22, 2015, total amount $856,137.35. Approval of warrant number 16066, dated 11-5-2015, total warrant amount $403,841.61, and approval of draft minutes, regular meeting 10-22-15. So moved. Second. Moved by Mr. Hainer, seconded by Mr. Thielman. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. The consent agenda is adopted. Policies and procedures. Yes. Yes. Judd is not here. We'll be meeting next week. Okay. Budget. Oh. Um, we have, we met um, a couple weeks ago 
And we have the second read of the draft budget calendar available for you. I forgot to update it with which principles are going to show up when, but I'll do that before I give it to Ms. Um, Fitzgerald. Um, can I get a motion to approve? So moved. Okay, and, uh, oops, sorry. That's, that's okay, as yeah. as sorry. changed by the chair. Yeah, oh, okay. The upcoming changes. Yeah, as yeah. Yes, okay. uh, Dr. Bodie, we're flipping principles. We just oh, had We have filled it in. Okay. okay. Oh, 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 oh. So yes. Um, December 8th, the Thursday night. The 8th? 10th. So the 10th. 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 Yeah. 10th. Then come on um, the 8th, too. <laughs> I think that will help. They'll respectfully decline. But they have conferences that night. Mm -hmm. We set the conferences before we, we um, sort of set the. Uh, when they were going to be coming. So what we're going to do this year is have the secondary principals, and we could even have uh, special education if, if that could work out, um, and have the elementary principals come on the following Thursday. Okay. Okay. Very good. Okay. Moved by. I don't know. Moved by Thielman, second by uh, Seuss uh, to adopt the. Uh, the calendar, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? It's adopted. Um, anything else under budget? Um, we'll be meeting again next week to discuss the um, Pierce Field fees at greater length. Okay. The proposal. Okay. Facilities, Ms. Starks. Uh, nothing to report. I'm optimistic that this uh, group is going to get together and I'm going to get a doodle and I'm going to go to a meeting. All right. <coughs> From that. Yeah. District Accountability, Curriculum Instruction and Assessment, Mr. Thielman. No report. Now we've completed the home evaluation, so we'll put a meeting together and start uh -huh. evaluating the evaluation process. Okay. Coming up Community with Relations, <laughs> Dr. Seuss. Uh, we met a couple weeks ago. Um, we discussed uh, the website, the dashboards. We discussed the survey. We're going to have a second read um, at the survey uh, this coming Monday. Um, we discussed how to do outreach to the community on our enrollment challenges, and one tentative proposal is to have another large community mm -hmm. forum in the very first mm -hmm. week of January, and we should know what's going on with the high school. And I've been meeting with some community members who have some ideas on that, what that forum should look like, and I'll be, we'll be discussing that Monday. Just on the topic of the dashboard, uh, we're trying to do that in Lowell as well. That's one of the superintendents goals and uh, I've been looking around for districts who have done it well in Massachusetts mm. and have more or less struck out. So uh, I saw some, I had a list of some that I thought were better in across term, the or I'm thinking country. about the, the, the back engine, the, the technical stuff oh, behind mm -hmm. it. Uh, but uh, Providence, Rhode Island is uh, oh, okay. is one that we should be thinking about. I will about. check them out. So I, I will check that out because I need to professionally and if I find something um, that, that is um, uh, appropriate for us to play with our Great, awesome. Send, send Thank the you word. very much. Um, may, may yeah, I Dr. Uh, Bode. Uh, Adam, one of the things that we found is that um, when you look to see whether it's going to be a uh, content management, mm -hmm. because we're finding there's a lot of limitations in terms of what we can do on a server, what I'm really interested in is is also like what what topics to do in the the dashboard. So if anybody wants to add into this, be great. Mm -hmm. But we did find that a lot of the ones that were very attractive or perhaps interactive, mm -hmm. all were uh, content managed. I don't I don't know whether well, you're going to go. That's about the website in general, isn't that? Mm -hmm. yeah, but that would be the dashboard too. Right. Whether you want to, but we could do a, a page long dashboard that would. You know, you can scroll down and see all this data. Or we could do hire someone to do just the dashboard, because that'll be cheaper than the mm -hmm. whole web page. Well, uh, well Lowell's we'll looking to go them, to yeah. Tableau is a possibility, and uh, party. Uh, it, it seems to be a good option for us. We've done some stuff for disseminating district data within uh, a couple of grade levels using Tableau. And we're further exploring that, and uh, Providence is using Tableau, and it's relatively inexpensive compared yeah. to hmm. what we have to do elsewhere. So, Tableau? Uh, Tableau. But uh, I'll, I'll get in touch with, uh, with 
uh, with you uh, <laughs> okay. and the committee Great. as yeah, to awesome. what, where Lowell's going with this, because uh, I think yeah, we're finally going in a promising direction. Uh, anything else for community relations? Uh, no, we just have a meeting on Monday, so. Okay. I won't say anything about the executive session well, minute review subcommittee. I, I need the board to uh, help me with this. Uh, I, I don't want to beat it. I, I'd like a to suggest a recommendation for, for what has been done to send it out to legal and get their, their impression. It, it's difficult, and I appreciate it. It's easier for me. I have the time, and I, I was able to do it. But this is something that's just going to continually to pile up on us. Yeah, yeah it's tough it, when, you, when yeah. you're... Uh, uh, it's working full time. I, I not, agree. Not I agree. I, I agree. And, and Mr. Pierce has had trouble too. So I mean, with the, through the chair uh, to the board, is there any problem sending it, uh, sending the the questionable pieces to council? And I'll produce a document for you all to see mm -hmm. that you can you can look at. But there's the the ones that are obvious. They have to be released because the time has gone by and it has no impact. Mm -hmm. There are the ones that absolutely cannot be released because this, they're covered under the law of FERPA and a thousand other things. And then there's the questionable ones. And those, those are the ones, I think what uh, Kirstie and I did the last time was we sent the, the two, mm -hmm. the questionable ones and the ones we felt closed. We sent the whole thing mm -hmm. to council, but the, the real ones they looked at were the other two. Just to get this out of the way, because they, we've already had, I think, four or five executive sessions since then. They've added more yeah. to it. Yeah. So, I, I would have no objection. I have no objection. Yeah. Uh, hearing no objection. Wait, 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 wait. Dr. Allison Ampey. Yeah, trying to be good. Um, this would be town council you'd be sending it to, yes? Pardon me? Town council, yes? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. No, I don't have That's who we used the last time as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. A warrant committee. Everybody get paid. School Enrollment Task Force. Hasn't met yet. Okay. Well, I understand you're waiting for your happy meeting. Yes. Um, announcement? I just want to, uh, before I go to announcements, I just want to mention that I did attend the MASC conference mm -hmm. and the de delegate assembly, and I want to report back that, that our resolution pertaining to the mandate of uh, Teaching Strategies Gold was approved and very well received by the entire delegate assembly, Great. so that is now an official resolution of MASC, and I want to thank the AEA for bringing that forward and bringing it to us, and we've just added to, uh, to the message. Announcements. Mr. Hainer. I'd like to mention Veterans Day yesterday. It was a great parade and turnout even in the rain. I'd like to thank all the people, especially the young parents who brought their children out. It meant a lot to all the vets that were there. Uh, it, uh, they had the ceremony inside the new fire station and then went out afterwards. I would also like to announce that the Thompson Annual Town Meeting, all the third graders, will be held in the town hall tomorrow morning. Each class has prepared their own articles. Mr. Hainer, I heard a rumor that you're going to be going swimming in... in <laughs> On uh, January 23rd, uh, there will be another polar plunge. Uh, I'm doing it again. This year, they've extended it to virtual plungers. Oh, what? no. Not no, 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 I don't, no, no, no. I, 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 I've already got your money. I don't have to worry about it. But no, no, I am, I am committed in more ways than one to go into the water. But. Uh, uh, Adam Chapelain is the current president of Rotary, and he, he, he shivers every time I mention the polar plunge. So I hit him yesterday with he can be a virtual plunger if he mm -hmm. wanted. Virtual plunger. So, and they've even put a snow day in this year, uh, okay. which is a week later. So. Uh, now, Mr. Heiner, if somebody is watching this on TV or if the advocate might want to pick this up, how would somebody uh, explain to me where the funds are going for your swimming thing Thank and you. how they would donate to you? Thank you. The, uh, they're not donating to me. I never see Through any of the you. money. It <laughs> goes. Rotary has a, a very strong uh, program to eradicate polio throughout the world, mm -hmm. and they've put millions and millions of dollars. Last year, we were matched two to one by the Bill and Melinda Gates mm -hmm. uh, Fund. Uh, I got through donations. To, from the wonderful people here in town, $1,500. So that, that resulted in a $4,500 uh, donation to it. To, to, right now, currently, there are only two countries left that, as far as we know, are uh, with polio, and that's Afghanistan and Pakistan, and uh, we're close. Um, 
what I will do is connect with the advocate and I will do a brief article on that and there'll be a web page that you can go to or if you don't like me uh, use the uh, internet to send money you can send it to the Arlington Rotary Club uh, and just on the memo just put uh, for polio or polar plunge uh, like that okay. thank you very much appreciate it any other announcements from the committee uh, Mr. Spiegel do we need an executive session tonight Uh, the uh, amendment to the. Yeah. Okay. So um, uh, no other business before us. We will go to executive session. We're going to come out for a vote. Um, do we need to come out? Did you just, we're just discussing that. Do we? Do we need to vote this? I think we do. Hmm. Um, to sign. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, we will come back very briefly at the end of the conclusion of executive session. Uh, this will not be a long one, I don't think. So a motion is to, uh, uh, which is this, to conduct strategy sessions in preparation for negotiation the union or non-union personnel or contract negotiations with union or non-union in which if held in an opening meeting may be detrimental or to conduct strategy with respect to collective bargaining or litigation in which held in an open meeting may have a detrimental effect. Collective bargaining may also be conducted. Move, moved by Dr. Allison Ampey, second by Mr. Thielman. Roll call, Ms. Dr. Allison Ampey. Aye. Mr. Thielman. Aye. Dr. Seuss. Yes. Chair votes aye. Ms. Starks. Yes. Mr. Hayner. Aye. Uh, we are in executive session. Okay, we, we, we are back. Uh, Mr. Hayner. Move to authorize the chair to sign the memorandum of agreement between the school committee and the AEA. S second by Ms. Starks. All in favor? Aye. aye. Opposed? Unanimous vote. Thank Motion you very to much. Adjourn. Motion to adjourn by Mr. Okay. Hayner. Second by. Ms. Starks, all in favor? Aye. Aye. We are in